Um, I'll start with Howard Bloom. Tell me wh where you think this is going to happen. What's going to happen over the next year or so, uh, and and how what will what factors will cause change? I think. One of the important things the FBI did in the Gotti case was not just take down John Gotti. They really destroyed the whole family. As pointed out, they got the administration. They're moving against the capos in trials. I think Sammy the Bull is going to be effective in, in the courtroom in cases to come. And I think out of those ashes, uh, the Gambino family, a decimated version of the Gambino family, will of course survive. But I don't think uh, John Gotti Jr. is going to be at the top of it. You think John Gotti Sr. will ever get out of prison? I don't think so, no. 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 Jerry? No, it's pretty much what, what I've written before. Yeah, John Gotti uh, Sr. Uh, or John Gotti the boss will, will probably die in jail. Uh, I don't think his son will carry on too much longer as the acting boss for his son. I would say the key period is next spring when Jimmy Brown Fiella, James Fiella, goes on trial along with another captain. Uh, two captains go on trial next spring, Jimmy Brown Fiella and uh, Danny Marino. Uh, both of them in the same case. They're accused of racketeering and a specific murder on Gotti's behalf. And they're two powerful captains. Right now, like I said earlier, they've got their own problems, the law, their own case. When that trial is over, I think, uh, and I think that will pretty much end Gravano's testimony. And I think the Gambino crime family will try and reassert itself. Somebody will come to the and front. And what happens to Gravano? Uh, Gravano hopes that he gets out of jail really quickly. I mean, he's Which done, is the reason he did it in the first right, place. He served I about three years. Uh, the, 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 the guessing is that he'll probably get somewhere between six and ten years in prison, uh, similar to what uh, Leonetti got uh, uh, after, you know, for his cooperation. Uh, Jerry Pizzi's column, Gangland, is in the New York Daily News. Howard Bloom's book, Gangland. Uh, Richard, I assume you'll be back on a criminal trial somewhere. Somewhere, next, someplace. Yeah, who are you, are you representing any of these figures coming up? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Thank you all. I'm sorry John Miller couldn't be here. We saw his footage. Uh, John is a, a frequent guest on this broadcast, and hopefully he'll be back very soon. Just to make ends meet. Playing towards me.
Mecca, the Jew of the East to help me build my black mind before I lose my fucking mind. Or end up doing time for some crab or snake, always trying to run games like they in a fucking race. Hugging on your nuts like a five dollar slut. So to all my real niggas, I'm giving big up. Showbiz, say G, the Legion Black Sheep, Buck Wild Diamond D, T, B, O, the Gangsta Fat Joe, Lil Book Projects, Patterson Projects, Forest Projects, Jordan Big West, and my man Lil Finesse. The funky technician hit me up with the track to make the niggas stop and listen. Now I'm out. First, reputed mobster John Gotti has been acquitted three times in New York City, but this time around he may not be so lucky. Earlier this week, Gotti's right-hand man, Sammy the Bull Gravano, has turned state's evidence and he plans to testify against Gotti. Here to talk about this stunning development of mafia experts, John Miller of WNBC News, defense attorney James LaRosa, former federal prosecutor Ed McDonald, and Daily News columnist Jerry Capisi. Welcome. Any, any of that introduction serve well? I think it's served accurately yeah, right get, around. It, what's interesting is you all know each other. This is a constant conversation. You reporting, you're constantly being called on to talk about it. Jerry writes a column, and you as an attorney. Who, um, I think we all know each other very well. Here is my, my first question, really, and, and I'll turn to John. Why did he do this? I mean, tell me who Sammy the Bull Gravano is, and why did he do what he's done? Sammy the Bull Gravano is really the day-to-day -day manager of the Gambino crime family. Uh, when you're talking about the position of underboss, it's, it's, uh, the boss's entire agenda is for insulation. He doesn't want to be meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. He doesn't want people being able to testify against him. So his marching orders are really carried out day-to-day -day by the underboss, who knows what everybody's doing, what operations are going on, who has a hand in what. He is uh, probably, of anyone, you could make a deal with the guy who could do the most damage to a crime family. Especially, especially yeah, yeah, in this Jared. case, because uh, in, the, in the Gambino crime family, John Gotti took over in 1986, right after the killing of Paul Castellano. And Sammy the Bull basically came from the Castellano wing, or that faction of the, of the, of the crime family. Enabling Gotti to consolidate his power. To consolidate, right, and to find out, in other words, Gotti had to find out who do I own? What companies do I have? Mm. And, you know, what have I got? And Sammy Bull helped, uh, you know, John Gotti find that out. So why is a guy, what kind of pressure would the feds have used? I don't know whether they had to use very much at all. In fact, uh, uh, under the law, uh, once he had counsel, and of course he had counsel a moment once he was indicted, the, the feds were not permitted to speak to him. I think that, and I don't know what happened, I would imagine this is something that, that, that he did on his own, maybe through family Why would he do it? Because he was afraid he was going to die in prison. He's sitting there looking at, at 50 years, 60 years in prison. He knows that, that many of the mobsters in the last five or five or six years have gotten uh, uh, substantial prison terms, and he's looked at people like uh, Philly Ristelli, who was the, uh, the boss of the Bonanno crime family who recently died in prison, looked at Paul Castellano, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Vario, who died in prison. Paul Castellano uh, died on the streets. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, he sees that these people are, are, you know, have actually died in prison. He's in his mid-40s. He's looking at 40 or 30 or 40 years in prison, and he says, what's going to happen to me at the end? I'm going to die. Yeah. I'm going to die in jail. And I think it's just something he didn't want. I think he probably was living in luxury for the last few years and was comfortable, and he just, he just wasn't as tough yeah. as the old-timers. And what happens to the so-called omerta uh, code of silence here? Obviously, it doesn't exist <laughs> very well. Uh, I think he might have done John Gotti a favor, though. Why? Long range. I think that they now have a witness that Al Krieger, who's John Gotti's lawyer, can cross-examine effectively. I think that they have another presentation to make to this jury, not just the tapes that they were trying to defend against. I don't think the ball game's over yet. John, do you agree with that? I think uh, that the prosecution uh, has a real balancing act because, as Ed McDonald will tell you, um, they have their own baggage. The question is, how heavy is this bag? And the baggage is the, the, is the, the, track, the criminal record of Gravano and, and how he might be, uh, his, his testimony might not be credible. It's uh, not that it wouldn't be credible, 
They are likely to, to believe jury. everything he says, but they may be just so repulsed by the idea that he's getting the deal after all he admits to on that witness stand that they reject the entire case. It's a, it's a theory that actually Ed calls jury nullification. Yeah. But it depends on how, how good a deal Sammy the Bull got. And I'll tell you, Ed McDonald's only two years out of, out of the business, and I'll bet you that he'd like to go into court with Sammy the Bull Gravano testifying against John Gotti, especially well, with what's on those tapes. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I mean, he well, can tell explain, me about the tapes. Well, on the tapes, they talk about murder after murder after murder that they get involved in together. Yeah. Granted that most of the murders on the tapes, as far as I, I, I've been able to hear, uh, pertain to murders that John Gotti authorizes after Sammy Bull comes to, comes to John and says, hey, John, I want to whack this guy, I want to whack this guy. In fact, there's one conversation where John says, hey, what is it with you? You want to whack everybody you're in business with. But I think that is Sammy Bull... Is that the term Bull, he uses, whack? Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. yeah, that's, the, I think, one of the key terms that, uh, that yeah. they use when they're referring to killing people. But I think um, uh, any prosecutor would love to have one of the guys who's on tape explaining to the jury exactly what it was they were talking about when they talked about whacking, uh, uh, you know, Di Bernardo or Louis yeah. DeBono or Well, Jerry, I think <clears throat> if the tapes are clear then I think Jimmy is right, that, that uh, the, the government is really creating problems for itself. Uh -huh. I mean, if you don't have any sort of confusion or ambiguity on the tapes, and the tapes speak for themselves, then you're not going to need somebody like Ravano, and you hurt your case by calling Ravano. But if they're talking about Joey, and it could be any number of ten Joeys, and if they're talking in mm -hmm. terms of maybe they use some other expressions other than whack and some other, you know, sort of slang, and uh, cl a clever defense lawyer can suggest, well, they really weren't talking about that. I mean, people all the time are saying, oh, I'm going to kill my kid. My kid's uh -huh. driving me crazy. You don't really mean to kill your kid. And clever lawyers can come up with arguments and can create confusion and ambiguity. And if, that, if that's what the tapes are like, then they might need a Gravano to say who they were talking about and what they were talking about and when. But uh, if the tapes are crystal clear and, 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 you can, and you know who they're talking about and the government can convince the jury who they were, about who they were talking about and what they were talking about, then, you, then they're harmed by calling somebody like Gravano. So answer Jim's case. Would, would you, in fact, like to have him, or, or I guess it was Jerry that made the point, if you were prosecuting this case, would you want to have Sammy the Bull as a witness? Well, I hate to beg off. I mean, I'd like to know, I don't know the, the details of the case. I don't know the details of the tapes. And I haven't you know, spoken to Gravano. I mean, Gravano could be, he could, he could prove to be a terrible witness. I mean, he could know everything. We had people, you know, informants come in and turn and cooperate who we didn't call as witnesses. We had other witnesses who were absolutely, you know, you would look at them and you would think they were reprehensible. You would think that they were, you know, dumb as stones. I mean, Henry Hill was a guy who was a right. perfect example. Henry Explain Hill, who Henry Hill is. Henry Hill was the, the uh, good fellows uh, the, the and the guy from we, Wise Guys. Yeah, the, the story was, was, was based on. It was a true story. And uh, Henry was, uh, I mean, barely articulate. I mean, he was, you would think that he would be a terrible witness. And he was. On the witness stand, he was a terrible witness. But he had some quality about himself that he, he was able to just, you know, produce conviction after conviction after conviction. And you never know. I mean, it, it's a crapshoot sometimes. You just don't know how a jury is going to react to a witness. Sam Gravano is going to bring a lot of luggage into this courtroom. What's a lot the luggage? Of, a lot of vicious crimes that he's committed by himself. And the jury's going to hear this. And cl clever defense lawyers like Al Krieger are going to bring it out. And they're going to bring out every piece of the detail. And they call Gravano the bull for a reason. Because he's got a thick neck, he allegedly takes steroids, he looks like a bull, and Gotti's going to come into that courtroom looking like a sleek greyhound. And, and uh, people are going to say what, you well, think? Well, they never root for the bull. They never <laughs> root for the bull. Yeah, the, another problem he has, though, <laughs> is, that you, is that, and mostly from John's, uh, John's shows, they're going to have, the government will be able to have tape after tape after tape of John Gotti walking down the street with the bull. And the, and the jury is going to sit there and they're going to say, if he is so bad, what was John Gotti doing with him day in and day out? And the government has surveillance tapes yeah. and they're on tape John. talking together. What's Gotti's reaction? I mean, do we know what he said about this? No, but I think everybody's reaction about Gotti's reaction is the same, which is, I would have loved to have been a fly <laughs> on the wall when, when somebody the... told him. Um, I think... The extension of Gotti's reaction, which always flows yeah. from the lawyers, is interesting because if you listen to the lawyers' rhetoric building up to this, they were always saying, but, you know, these are men. These are good men. John Gotti, Sam Gravano, Frank Lacasio, these are, you know, solid guys. Well, I mean, they've been building up Sam Gravano as, yeah. uh, as quite a character, and they're going to be backpedaling on that for a long time and very quickly. Is, if, if Gotti 
is there, how serious, how significant, how would you characterize the effort to convict John Gotti? Oh, it's been monumental. I, mean, <laughs> I know. I'd... It, it's it's you know he's been target number one, public enemy number one ever since he was acquitted of racketeering charges in 1987. This in March very of move is so demonstrative of that because you have to say, well, we always we always use the little fish to catch the bigger fish, yeah. but when you start cutting deals on the level of underboss, yeah. I mean that's the second biggest fish in the sea. Um, you're using some very big fish to catch other big fish. Well, they must they're really they're want they're they're three, uh, They've used the bosses before, yeah. and we've th five or six weeks ago we had a boss. Yeah, they're not. Yeah. They're uh, not looking come into him. the come into the you know cross the line and go on the other side. Yeah, well, so. he's important. He's probably even more important in the long run about other things he can tell them. I mean, if he tur if it turns out that he's, this, a, he's a worse guy, guy in this case in than the, Gotti is. Yeah, but what's he going to do about the future? What can he tell them about? I mean, he can take down, if he's an articulate and a bright witness and he has a good memory and he can and he can lead them to all the unions and all the businesses that they've controlled and he can get up there and he can lead them to corroboration and then testify about it and about the operations of other families and about the operations of all of the associated people, the businessmen, if there are politicians who are associated with them, labor union officials, it goes on and on and on. He was in a position to no, he is in a position to know. So he could be far more important in the war against organized crime as a as a person to provide um, uh, information, background information, and testimony in other cases than merely a witness against John Gotti. If John Gotti, if Gravano testifies, as I assume he will, and if in fact, if in fact there's a conviction, uh, what will it do to the family? I don't know, but can I go back to that last question? Yeah, you can. They they want John Gotti almost as bad as they wanted to win the Persian Gulf. I, I don't think anybody answered your question. Yeah. I think they want him very badly. He's thumbed his nose at the government. He's beaten them three times. He's become a bit of a folk hero. People talk about him in the street. Uh, uh, As a folk hero? Yes. They write letters to him. Uh, they, he wins polls on television programs and, and on and on. They write letters to newspaper reporters saying how, how good of a guy he is. You get those kinds of letters? Oh, uh, constantly. I so mean, yes. every week. From uh, the neighborhood? Or from just... people in the neighborhood. I mean, a lot. Look, to but be that's honest, always been true, has it not? No, no, no. It hasn't quite always been that true. No, I get letters every week from people telling me that the government is persecuting John Gotti. I get letters from people, you know, telling me that, you know, why don't you write about how come... They're keeping John Gotti in jail so without bail of for 11 months. You know, of course without, they for want 11 him. They months. want him badly. He's no. beaten them badly many three of, times in a row. Many of the letters, though, are form letters, and they're the same letters I get from, you know, week yeah. after week, and they've been Xerox copies. So I don't know how many original people get original yeah. thoughts mm -hmm. to write me letters. Does it make a lot of difference that Bruce Cutler is not on this case? Well, he's in a no-lose position right now. I mean, Bruce, Bruce mm. Cutler can't lose anymore. Yeah. I mean, he... He was the architect of three successive victories, and no matter what happens now, uh, Bruce Cutler is the biggest winner. But what about Gotti? In other words, is Gotti in a more vulnerable position, regardless of who the new lawyer is, because of this thing he had with Cutler? I think they had something unusual, the yeah. two of them. There's no question about what it. What was it? Um, I don't know, but uh, they seemed to walk together. They seemed to know what each was going to do. Um, I, th I think... Uh, Bruce yeah. fed off him, and he fed off Bruce. Yeah, there's no sense. question. I've that. never seen a, a, a situation where a client and an attorney uh, mesh the way the two of them do. You have done as much as anybody, uh, probably have reported more on this in terms of, certainly in terms of television. Have you had any success in getting to Gotti at all? I've had I mean, I've seen you on the street where he him, sort of brushes uh, you. Um, you know, but I mean, if you sit and talk to John Gotti like this, it's fine. If you sit and with a camera, with a camera, and try and talk to John Gotti, it's a very different thing. Uh, in that respect, he's a very private person. But when you sit and talk like this, you're talking about baseball. You're talking about uh, whatever was in the papers. You're not talking about crime. If you raise the question of crime, what happens? Maybe he'll make a joke about it. But I mean, there's no earnest discussion about it. You know, yeah. there's a company line there. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And that's the company line. Let me go back to the question of what happens if Gotti is convicted because of Gravano's testimony. What does that do to this family and to the other organized crime families? Well, I think does it, it start it, it, unraveling? I don't know whether, it, I think it might be too soon to say that it's unraveling. I think that um, certainly the family, all five families in New York have had their operations impeded 
by the convictions of the last few years, but it really hasn't affected life in the street, life in certain industries where organized crime has predominated, or at least organized crime has had some sort of effect and impact. And I think that uh, you have to remember that you know there in that family there are probably three or four hundred members. Someone will replace Gotti. Someone will, play, will, will replace Gravano. Maybe they won't be effective. Maybe there, there'll be some sort of disunity within the family, and there'll be maybe a, a war within the family. But you know, if there's a if there's an organized crime element controlling a certain union or a certain industry, and it's run by that family, it's going to continue to be run that way, uh, because the capo on the street is going to go to work every day and run his industry or run his his rackets. And until you go down to that level and you start taking out those people and you start, you start rooting out the corruption in these industries and the, uh, the, and the, that the corruption that has been there uh, for decades now, uh, you're not really going to have an impact. The government is not going to have a real impact. Do you agree with the characterization of how strongly the government is trying to get Gotti? And oh, how, uh, yeah, there's no question about and that. And yeah. does it bother you as a former prosecutor that Gotti has this reputation as a kind of folk hero, the way he dresses, the way he carries himself, and the fact that he's beaten the case against him three times? Well, it doesn't bother me in the sense that he didn't beat me. It was, yeah. My office yeah. never prosecuted him. Um, I thought that the I thought that at least two of the prosecutors... But I know a lot of prosecutors would be offended by the notion of someone that they tried so hard to get is being characterized as a folk hero. Well, I don't know. Jerry and I have gone back and forth on this a number of times, and uh, Jerry feels that he is a, a folk hero, and that large percentage of the people in the Italian American communities really sort of revere John Gotti. And I think that it's a much smaller segment of the communities. I think it's a very vocal and outspoken segment of the communities, but I think it's a it's a very negligible percentage of, I think of it's the. It's a lot bigger. Uh, well, it's a lot bigger. I think yeah. it's a lot Thirty-six bigger. jurors in a row. That's yeah. Well, but that's that, but that, what? that's quite a. Oh, yeah, oh you but, said not guilty. But that doesn't say they revere him. That just says that the government went to bat with really weak cases, with really poor cases. In in two instances, and in, in the in the case in New York County, I think there was good lawyering. Good yeah. lawyering got him off on a on a case that was really a close call. Yeah. But I don't think that means that because 36 people said not guilty, that people in the in the Italian American communities in this city revere John Gotti. No, I don't either. I I, I don't. I don't think that the Italian American community reveres John Gotti. I think in some communities, like Ozone Park, he is a hero. I mean, uh, in, in Howard Beach, perhaps he's a hero. I don't think the entire Italian American community uh, yeah. loves and adores. How John did they Gotti. get these tapes? Well, they put they put several bugs in and in, in, in and about the uh, Ravenite Social Club on Mulberry right. Street. Uh, what they did was, and it's, it's interesting, is that they had a, ta a bug in the Ravenite Social Club proper. Uh, which really wasn't which working got so well, club. right on on Mulberry Street. That bug wasn't really working so well, but John Gotti didn't know that, and he went outside the Ravenite upstairs to an apartment and in a hallway where they had bugs that were working pretty well. And I'm told that the the more damaging tapes occur, conversations occur in those hallway conversations and in the conversations mm -hmm. up in the apartment above the Ravenite. I don't know exactly how the FBI uh, breaks into. Uh, uh, into uh, apartments, uh, especially on Mulberry Street, uh, which is a pretty uh, closed community, to put the bugs in. But uh, however they did it, it you know, had to be something. Yeah, it had and to go in more and the once. tapes are every bit as important as Emmy. Oh, the far more. Far they're, more important. they're nearly useless without each other. Yeah. Oh, I disagree um, with you. I, I think but, that, well, if, you, if you're talking about decoding them and all that, I would say that the tapes are the killer tapes and they should have stopped there and making a deal was foolish. But remember, we're Would dealing you say that? I would, but yeah. remember, in reality, we're dealing with the experience we've seen in uh, in the uh, Gene Gotti case and in other cases in the in the State Gotti case, where you say, "Well, tapes don't lie," yeah. and then clever defense lawyers get up and they do their best, and by the time they're <coughs> finished, you're sitting there in the same courtroom, having heard the same tapes with the transcript yeah. in front of you, saying, "Yeah, but that tape doesn't really say this." Yeah. You know, the hand is quicker than the eye or something, yeah, but, but it worked, the and it worked two or three times. And even, it, even in cases of videotape, not just audio tape. No, but the difference is, it's not so much video. If you have somebody on videotape, that's per, usually the end of the story. You're talking well, about the yeah, 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 I know, but... But, uh, yeah. but one of the things, in the, in the New York County case, they had tapes, but the audibility was atrocious. Yeah. From what I understand, the audibility in this case, the, the, the audibility is excellent. In, yeah. in this case, too, one fact that seems to uh, get lost every day is that a judge who is not one of the strictest, most conservative judges in the world, Leo Glasser, has listened to these tapes and found that they prove beyond a doubt that John Gotti is a danger to the community because he kills people and he obstructs justice. And he has kept him in jail without bail for 11 months now. 
Now, Leo Glass is not the most conservative judge. He's a, you know, re relatively liberal. He makes the government work for its convictions, and uh, he uh, doesn't let them get away with a lot of stuff that other judges do. He's not a government judge. Let me just go around the circle here. What's the biggest misconception about organized crime in America? Hmm. Biggest misconception? Yeah. Isn't it uh, probably that it's as big as it is, I would guess. Well, I think just the I think the biggest misconception right now we've got because we have two years in a row, the New York Times has written stories saying that the mob is dead. Yeah, the mob is misconception dead. Misconception is think, that it's alive and well and kicking. Uh, there's and, no question and that, that it's alive and well. And whenever somebody's knocked off, someone else steps up to steps replace them. Steps up the structure of organized crime, the Italian American organized yeah. crime, the mafia is so ingrained that and so well, and the tradition is so goes back so long that uh, it's going to take another and we'll 10, 20, 30 years. And will continue even if goes to jail. No question about it. What's the biggest I think probably the misconception is the, the Hollywood uh, glorification or glamorization of the mafia. I think that uh, um, uh, uh, that it isn't like that at all. I think that these people are, are thugs. Uh, they're very brutal. Um, uh, they're greedy, and they're not. Uh, they could be charming on certain levels, but uh, when it comes to business, these people are very uh, brutal, despicable people. John, I think the biggest misconception that is borne out now is this omerta, the oath of silence. I think that is a part of mob history because it is clearly gone. And that seems to be a, a looming threat, does it not, especially if Gravano... Absolutely. And it's a domino effect. I mean, in the commission case, when the bosses all got sentenced to a hundred years, yeah. and then they had trials before that where they were sentenced to a hundred years, you take a guy in his thirties and forties in a significant organized crime position who says, a hundred years? Have you got a minute? That's a long time. <laughs> Can we talk? <laughs> if I did 15, I could, I could be out when I'm 50-something years old. I have a life to live after that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's weighing heavily, especially when they see the other yeah. lesser lights uh, rolling over and having success. Michael yeah. Francis making movies about himself. He yeah. got arrested today. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, some financial indiscretion. All right, one, I'm, I'm over, out of time here. Now, with respect to Gravano, he will go into, uh, he is now, and will go into witness protection, correct? That's correct, yeah. What would be the threat to his family, if any? His, his family personal has family. elected to stay behind so far, yeah. which is very unusual. And if, in fact, have said what a stupid thing he's done, yeah. if, if what I read in the paper, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, Jerry. Well, that's what I that's what I read today. Also, uh, I don't know if they've gone quite that far as to say what a stupid thing he's done. But as of now, they're not in the uh, you know they're not in the witness protection program, and uh, you never know if if Sammy Bull does testify for the government. They may testify for the defense. Who knows? Uh, i, I got to ask this. If, if you were representing Sammy the Bull and he came to you and said, this is what I'm going to do, what would you say to him? I would have said, that's your choice. Fine. That's all? You wouldn't yeah. have said... You're about to get a crash course on acting. They're going to take you into studio equity and drill you for 90 days and get you ready. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Pleasure to have you. We'll be back and we'll talk about politics, a new paradigm with Joe Klein, Jim Pinkerton. But first, and the trial of reputed mob boss John Gotti is coming to a head in a Manhattan federal court. The prosecution star witness, Gotti underboss, Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano, took the stand today. His testimony is expected to include Gotti's involvement in the rub out of his predecessor, Gambino family boss Paul Castellano. Joining us now for an update on the testimony and their predictions are Ed McDonald. He is a former federal prosecutor, now defense attorney, defense attorney Gerald Lefcourt, and John Miller of WNBC Television News in New York. John Miller is coming. He should be here in just a few minutes. Uh, joining us also is David Lewis, a well-known defense attorney who has been on this broadcast before, and we're pleased to have all of you. And when John comes, we'll have him join us. Uh, he was there at the trial and give us some sense of, of what happened during that trial and, and the mood and the atmosphere. Uh, let me just start with you, Gerald Lefcourt. Uh, tell me what Gravano and the significance of Gravano's testimony. It is on the front page of Tuesday's New York Times. Close confidant of Gotti testifies of mafia family's violent reign, describes in detail a plot to murder Castellano. Here is Sammy the Bull takes the tan, digging Gotti's grave. God, Godfather's ex-underboss tells how they plan rub out of Castellano. Uh, well, uh, from the government's point of view, he's taken the stand and said, I was number two in this Gambino organized crime family, and he was the boss, John Gotti, that is, and uh, I was at planning meetings uh, when uh, the killing of Paul Castellano was discussed. I even met with shooters right. who actually did the shooting. But the and problem... Then, go ahead. But the problem that uh, is, is easily foreseen is that prior to Sammy the Bull becoming a government witness, the government's whole case 
And the other star witness, who was no longer now even a witness, perhaps, was a person who was an innocent bystander on the street who was going to testify that John Gotti was on a street corner saying, what happened to those guys? And he identified Gotti as being on the street corner. Now, Sammy the Bull gets on the stand and says, I was on the inside of the family. Right. And he wasn't on any street corner. Rather, we were in a car nearby. driving around yeah. nearby. Now, it's a direct contradiction of what the whole government's case was before. I'm sure that this is something that's going to be exploited by the defense, because now this guy comes in who has a motive, by the way, from the defense point of view, at least that's what they've been arguing, uh, to kill all these people who were charged with being the victims or the, or the intended victims of murder, namely Sammy the Bull, who is probably going to be, uh, you know, portrayed as a lunatic. Is that you have represented people accused of being members of organized crime, correct? I have. And so, David Lewis, have you been represented people accused of being members of organized crime? You have, and you probably will in the future. Uh, let me just raise this question. If you are the defense attorney and you're representing someone like John Gotti in this case, and you've got someone with the credentials of Mr. Uh, Gravano who is going to testify against your client, and the prosecution is stepping forward to say, yes, he has admitted 19 murders, and, and yes, this is a guy who is no better than John Gotti, uh, but we want you to believe him because we've got tapes and we've got his testimony. What do you have to do to discredit Gravano? Well, there are two problems. First, you've got to make sure that Gravano is far worse than any defendant in the courtroom by virtue of the acts he admits and acts that he has concealed from you the You as a defense attorney have to Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. That's the first goal. The second goal is that while Gravano is going to say many things that the tapes mirror, there's an awful lot that the government wants from Gravano that they can't prove with the tapes. And so it's a little like the cross-examination is going to set up the argument that a guy comes in and says, I killed a grizzly bear with a pencil. Here, Charlie, here's the pencil. Well, that's not enough proof. And the two issues are what's real, what's made up, and whether or not what Gravano is so taints the courtroom that the jury can't convict anyone because Gravano is just so bad. And you're a former prosecutor, now defense attorney, and your job is to use. John Miller, come on in. John Miller from WNBC. Good to have you here. Uh, we are underway with a conversation about uh, what Gravano did. Let me switch first to John. Uh, tell me about this day in court, John. I mean, how the mood and, and what Gravano said as we well, a chance to put your mic on. I think uh, without burying the lead, what Gravano said was he was in the car with John Gotti, standing by for Big Paul Castellano to be murdered. Um, prior to that, of course, the whole lead up to it was the history of his becoming a gangster, becoming a made member of the family, and then first being approached by Gotti's camp to gain his political support within the family to murder their own boss. What, what, now set up the mood for me. That's the testimony. What did, did John Gotti stare at him? Did Gravano avoid looking at Gotti? What was the... This was truly high noon. Um, I mean, this has been a trial that's already a month in progress, uh, playing all kinds of tapes, tapes of Gotti and Gravano talking in secret in this uh, location where the FBI had their bugs. So to actually see Sam Gravano sit up on the witness stand and stare straight past John Gotti as Gotti was drilling him with those eyes, trying to catch his eye, trying to stare him down, an entire front row of assorted made members of the Gambino crime family, family members, supporters, yeah. hang around guys, all staring at Gravano, uh, trying to turn up the heat. Um, when they called for Gravano, the door's supposed to open, he's supposed to come in, there was a full four minutes that went by from wherever they had him hidden down whatever hallway in whatever bunker before he was produced. You could have heard a pin drop during that entire time. It was uh, certainly the climax of the trial so far. Yeah. And the most important thing that Gravano said was that he was in the car and with he Gotti puts and that John Gotti, Gotti at the murder scene. And does he put in John Gotti's mouth, kill Paul Castellano? He, he puts in John Gotti's mouth and in the mouths of John Gotti's cronies through a series of meetings, the uh, intricate planning and uh, politicking that went up to the murder at yeah. Gotti's behest. You, if you are the prosecutor, put yourself in that position again, what do you have to do to, to, in a sense, take this man and make his testimony believable despite what the defense is going to do in order to destroy his credibility and say to that jury, you can't believe this man because of who he is? Well, first of all, you have to realize that the, that the defense is a serious problem here in cross-examining uh, Gravano. 
cross-examination of Gravano was going to be based on two things. Uh, one is his motive to lie, to, to make a better deal for himself. But secondly, they want to bring out all of his bad acts, his whole career of crime, his 19 murders, uh, the fact that he's just totally reprehensible and just a disgusting human being. But the problem is, is that the jury has already listened to four weeks of tape-recorded conversations. And in most of those conversations, John Gotti is speaking to his constant companion, Sammy Gravano. So the jury is going to say, if, if Sammy Gravano was so bad, what is John Gotti doing hanging around with him? They have to say to themselves, well, you know, what he says makes, makes some sense. There's a ring of truth here because these people are constantly together. The things that they're talking about, I mean, after a while, it begins to just pile up. You know, when they're talking about whacking somebody, I mean, they can argue from now until the cows come home that, you know, when they were saying whack, they meant something else. But after, after four weeks of constant conversation after conversation with But Ed, how are they going to explain the fact that their whole case was based on a so-called innocent that's, bystander? That's, okay, how did they get this guy you, to say that? They, all right, now Before that's Before they had Gravano. Let me, I mean, right, don't you think I, about well, Explain what you mean by innocent bystander. Somebody got some person who was not involved in the oh, yeah, family, yeah, right, right. just somebody on the street to place John Gotti on the street. How does the government get somebody right, to okay, say that? Avenue. But wait yeah, a minute. Right, wait, go ahead. <laughs> but but, but that, that wait, is, wait, hold on. Okay. Let's, let me, so he, this guy puts him on 2nd Avenue, and Gravano has him on 3rd Avenue. In a car, though. In a, in a, car. In a car, and he had him on the street. That, right. that um, could be a critical problem for the government. Well, one of them's got to be lying. I even okay. got that, but, David. But, but, the point is, <laughs> but the point is that it opens up Gravano to the idea that even a story about an event that he says he was part of is completely fabricated. So uh, how do you, how okay. can you Add this is Tell him how. No, I'm not going to tell him how because I'm <laughs> going to say that the problem that the government has here, and it looks as if the government has been, and I haven't seen, I haven't been present in the courtroom, and I've been following what I'm reading in the newspapers, and obviously the newspapers and the television are focused on the, on the Castellano murder. And, but it, is, it appears that the government has fallen into this almost a trap where they're making the Castellano murder the centerpiece of their case, you know, sort of the be-all and the end-all. And if they're doing that and they're disregarding the other predicate crimes, you have to remember there are five or six other murders involved in this case, and the proof on those could well, be very, very substantial. Most of them Sammy Gravano rather than John Gotti. Yeah, but John though. Gotti is admitting doing them right on the, on, the, on the tape. He's admitting that he's saying Sammy came and asked me to do it. And other ones, you know, he, that, that Sammy Gravano was not involved in, 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 in asking that he be executed. You know, the, the, uh, the, the Di Bernardo murder, and, and, there's the, the, you know, and there's two other ones in which he was involved. But they can't, well, I think that the government should really be focusing the jury's attention on the other cases, on the other murders, on the other crimes that are predicate crimes. They only have to have two predicate crimes in order to convict Gotti on the RICO count. They don't have to prove P Paul Castellano. What's a predicate murder. crime? For, the, the RICO um, uh, statute requires that you prove that the defendant participated in a pattern of racketeering okay. activity, and the and that pattern has to include two or more predicate that felonies. That statute is a statute which sort of ends the notion of fair trial in this country. For instance, uh, could William Kennedy Smith have been acquitted if they were allowed to bring in all those other allegations of similar conduct? Right. Wouldn't the jury have ended up saying to themselves, oh, he must be guilty of one of them, so let's convict him? And that's what the RICO statute is. It sort of ends the notion that a jury can sit and focus on, did he do that? beyond yeah. a reasonable doubt, because they throw so many things into yeah. the trial that they come away with saying, oh, I must have done so. Yeah. What's the most interesting question to you in all of this? In all of which? The Gra Gravano turning against Gotti and his testimony. I mean, obviously, one big question is whether the jury will convict him. But beyond that, the interplay of these personalities, what is just the most interesting? I, I think that it's so interesting that John Gotti has always portrayed himself, and we have essentially bought him as uh, the canny gangster, you know, the ultimate gangster, uh, the real gangster with the street sense, where the other guys have tried to simulate themselves as businessmen. Um, it shows that his judgment in picking a backup, uh, a guy that he considered was an excellent street boss, yeah. is uh, extremely poor. That's interesting to me, too, because there is, in, in one story I read, where God, somebody suggested that Sammy the Bull Gravano has been accused or maybe has acknowledged that he killed his best friend and rubbed out, uh, whacked, whacked his best friend. And that when Gotti saw that and heard about that, assuming that all these things are true, that Gotti should have known that if he'd do that, what might he do to me at some point if somebody gets to him? The interesting thing about this well, to me is that Gravano, according to this plea agreement, will probably be on the street in a few years. I mean, and I, here's I, a guy who's admitted to all of these murders. Okay, that's my second question. You know, what was the deal? Why did Gravano make the deal? Man? Well, he made the deal because he didn't want to die in jail. 
he was looking at a prison sentence of 100 years. He knew that if he were convicted in this case, which he probably okay, would Okay, but be, there are other people, haven't there been other people in that position who would have gone to prison for a long time if they didn't turn against someone else in the family? Sammy they were Gravano was ultimately an Erzart's gangster. I mean, uh, he had never done any prison time. He claimed to be this tough guy. And uh, the first time he spent a few weeks in jail, right. before he was in jail a year, not even convicted, but awaiting trial, not even with the, you know, the dark horizon of spending the rest of his life, with, with the full idea that if he beat this case, he might even walk out. He approached the feds and said, what do you want to know? He initiated the, the contact? I believe he had been offered uh, a way to approach the feds several times, and at some well, point lawyer he took it, the bait. Lawyer says he, it's not a question of how the feds got to him and twisted and turned and forced him by saying, you're going to sit in a cell and rot and all that no, stuff. The lawyer who was representing him has said publicly that he didn't even know that his client was uh, having conversations with the government. That he the reached FBI out. was sending feelers to yeah. him on a regular basis. Sure. Well, I don't know how they, they picked him as the, wink, the weak link, and they were right. And, and yeah. what is it they saw in him that made them think he was the weak link? A guy who had never done time, yeah. a guy who acted real tough, who he just didn't read as really being that tough. He worked too hard at it. Yeah. Is this? Go ahead, David. The real problem is, is that Gravano gets an agreement like this, and either somebody was on Second Avenue or somebody this was is third the, Avenue. So right. this is the agreement going that we uh, come. John and, brought this, I guess, did you? Yeah. And yeah. basically, the truth's for sale. And the end result is that whether they get Gotti or not in this case, a guy like Gravano, who clearly has all these murders, is someone who, for, for everybody else, is coming to a theater near you. I mean, this guy's getting out. And he's getting out because he joined Team America at the right yeah, time. So what's wrong with that? I mean, the, the, it... Because, what, you know, what's it, wrong because with that? there's a problem with reliability. When you make somebody an offer they can't refuse, whether you are the government or a mobster, yeah. it's still an offer you can't refuse. What they're saying to him is, you get out of jail if you help us okay. convict Gotti. Yeah. So he helps them are, convict Gotti. Are you Gotti. two guys saying that you don't believe Gravano because in terms of the testimonies we'll make? I have a substantial question about Gravano not knowing anything, except that he has committed, at, by his own admission, numerous murders, committed all these deaths. And are you saying that Why should we believe him now? I think if he's a killer, then selling the truth here, is a minor deal. And either, uh, my own conclusion is that if you don't believe, if you're willing to believe Gravano, and you're willing to believe the neutral eyewitness, then God, he's able to be on two avenues at once. Well, look, I Come think on, you guys. have to remember that this was a case that, it was a case that was brought with a lot of fanfare by the FBI before Sammy Gravano ever turned. And, uh, on a different theory, apparently. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. You're, again, you're focusing only on the Castellano That's murder, true. okay? And we're talking about a case with several other predicates, and, and, and you're talking about one witness, and you're talking about a lot of other proof that's involved in the case, circumstantial evidence, and tape-recorded conversations. It was a case that the government and the FBI felt very confident of. I mean, usually yeah. you don't hear the FBI shoot their the mouths off too often about getting, get, you know, guaranteeing victories. Once in a while they fail, but in big mafia cases, nine times out of ten, they win the cases. It begs the question, if the tapes were so good, and they are, if the evidence was so strong, and it seems to be, why did they want to affect, infect, if you will, the credibility of all of that superb evidence by bringing in as their partner the most despicable character well, in the I don't case. know. I don't know the answer, an answer to that. The maybe... answer is greed. The answer is prosecutors are greedy to have as much, and if it doesn't fit sometimes, then we'll sort of move the innocent neutral guy out in that one count, maybe. And we want as much as we can get so we can pile it all on. And in a RICO case, if you put enough in the landfill, everybody says, see, garbage. I mean, and look, that's that the happens, end of the That discussion. happens in some cases but when they you pile on with that form so it's yeah. They have to know John, that John, answer now. your own question. Why do you think they brought Gravano in? I think that, that they are like all other people. They put on a confident air, but they're basically insecure. And they're worried that the, that the tapes may not be enough. And if they've got also, something else, there was a, just a, a terrible hammer over their head. And if you asked them this, they would say it wasn't so. Right. But I, I don't mind uh, saying it for them. They could not afford to lose this case. They can't afford to lose it now. If John Gotti went up to the plate for the fourth time and hit it out of the ballpark, the feds would have to take their bats and their gloves and go home with their tails between their legs. They can't lose to a guy they've described as a cheap punk gangster four times in a row and still hold their heads but, but, but up when the raises, guy's becoming but, a folk But that hero. raises David's question. Have they endangered their case because of his credibility? In, I'm not a lawyer, which is the big advantage I have at this table. I think like <laughs> one of the poor schlumps sitting on the jury. And I now wonder 
with, with these tapes, with the FBI's clean seal on them, and with, with these witnesses, poor schlump civilians like me, who have no reason or motive to lie, yeah. how I'm going to be affected by this despicable character and why they have brought him here to, to taint um, the evidence. Yeah. Now, it may be that they're just thinking, the tapes are great, but there are gaps in them. Sammy can clear up the gaps. And where there's, on the tapes. When there's room for interpretation, we can say, well, never mind our interpretation with our expert agent. What were you guys yeah. talking about? And he can bring that home. I've got to get to this last point. How was he as a witness? Credible, in turn, just forget the history and all that, how he handled himself on the stand. He didn't come across as a terribly likable guy, although we gather he's not. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> He spoke very softly. Oh, come on. Oh, but this is the no, subject no, of rehearsal. Finish. Finish. This is, he, he hasn't spoke, been on cross yet. He spoke very <laughs> softly, and, uh, and he didn't uh, go out on any limbs with explanations. He was being very cautious to give the briefest answer to the prosecutor. So, uh, so he's, he seemed to be very nervous. But it's really, it, it's so early in the game. What happens here is that this witness has been uh, rehearsed probably 20 to 50 times before getting on the stand. And the direct is going in like a script. And then all of a sudden, Cross comes. And anything could happen on Cross. David, last word. I think we're going to see much more of what Gravano really is when Albert Krieger gets up to cross-examine. Is Krieger pretty good? Krieger excellent. is excellent. He may be the greatest cross-examiner ever. Ever? Ever. <laughs> Didn't know that. Wow. All right. That, stay tuned. Thank you all. Pleasure to have you. But first, we'll be right in the back. federal Stay courtroom, the trial of reputed mob boss John Gotti continues. Testifying for the prosecution, former Gotti underboss Sammy the Bull Gravano has detailed all 19 murders he himself took part in. Joining me now to tell us if this is the end for Gotti and what it may mean for organized crime are New York Newsday columnist Jimmy Breslin and John Miller from WNBC News. Welcome. You were in the courtroom today. Give me a sense of, of uh, what Gravano said today. I think what they were trying to do was to elicit uh, from Gravano the laundry list of all the things the mob can do. So the questioning bounced from, did you kill this guy and this guy and this guy, to the, did you fix this guy's case? How did you get to the member of the jury, you know, to which the jurors leaned forward to hear? Uh, well, it was the fish store across the street. The guy's daughter worked there, and uh, I suggested a gift of $10,000 would be appropriate, Gravano said. Then they moved on. How do you shake down the construction industry? What kind of money is it worth? How much does Gotti get? How much do you get? Uh, they moved on through, uh, how do you decide as a mobster which guys are allowed to plead guilty and which guys have to, uh, have to uh, fight it out? Who can uh, get contempt in a grand jury and how does the boss decide? They really wanted to give the jury an overview of how involved it all is. Now that they've gotten through Gravano's eyewitness account of a couple of major mob hits, they wanted to show them around the store a little. How is he doing as a witness? I mean, what's the, is there a kind of consensus among smart what, you know, courthouse types. He's doing very well as a witness, but he's in the easy part now. You know, they they are pitching him the the grounders, and he's you know uh, throwing them back. I think uh, on cross examination, which uh, will begin uh, tomorrow, that'll be his real challenge. But uh, his presence is very low key, and uh, to his credit, credibility wise, when he doesn't know something or can't remember, he doesn't fudge it. He says, "I don't know." Yeah. What do you think of this, Jimmy? I think. Uh out of 100, 88 uh, people, 88 percent, are absolutely certain that Gotti's gone. I mean, he might as well stay in jail. Out of, out of only 100. 12, there's only 12 more votes to count, yes. and then he'll be gone for sure. I mean, it's unanimous. He looks like he's gone, and it's up to the jury. Uh, Gravano, as he talks and tells the story, there's one very bad thing about his testimony. And then it sounds like the truth, yeah. which is the worst thing of all. That's worse than t the murder is the fact that guys tell that the they truth. in fact did it. Uh, yeah, he sounds like he's telling the truth, and I think they might have a tough time with him if he yeah. is. I mean, where he was saying, you know, where he says, "I don't know," yeah. uh, that's bad. What does it you remind you of? I mean, give me a kind of no, Breslin look at this guy. I never guy. saw anybody. Oh, this guy. Yeah, he's got to be a bed bug, huh? Yeah. And. Uh, uh, that he was paying a guy to spar with him and, and to look good as a fighter. He's a 40-year-old guy trying to learn how to use his hands in the gym. And uh, with the guy, Eddie V, that, that boxed yeah, the right. man a couple this of times. This is how you led the column. He, yes. he, uh, but he paid him. Yeah. Like he walked in with the two guys walked into the gym. There's a great big guy and there's a little Gravano. Yeah. 
So, Vico, you got, don't think that the big guy is the big shot. It's the little guy is the big one. He's the one that pays. <laughs> yes. and he, he never hit him back. He just boxed him and never hit him. Now, yeah. one thing about prize fighting, there are two parts to it. One is that you hit the guy, and the other is that sometimes he hits back, and it now is up to you. Can you take that punch? Well, Sammy never had the, he, the thrill of, uh, of uh, fear getting into that sphere. They never hit him. Yeah. In fact, he boxed with a heavyweight well, Sipes. Who didn't hit him? I mean, he just won. So there's something the matter with him from the go, if you're doing yeah, that. Yeah, and maybe that's a link to the fact that, that, that we have talked about on this broadcast mm -hmm. before, that mm -hmm. he decided to turn government witness because he'd never really been to prison, had he not? He and so therefore, time. the same thing. He hadn't he been hit. He's never point. been inside. He never was inside at all. Yeah. Huh? Well, he never was in a fight. Let me take a look. at This is from time. John Miller on WNBC television in New York, a piece that he put together about Sammy Gravano and who he is and how he got sure, to where he is. Take a look. There was no one closer to mob boss John Gotti than this man, Sam Gravano. Known to fellow mobsters as Sammy the Bull, Gravano was the alleged underboss to Gotti of the Gambino family, the largest crime family in the United States. News 4 has learned exclusively that Gravano has turned canary. He will be the star witness for federal prosecutors at the Gotti trial, the trial where he was supposed to be the second defendant. The idea that Gotti's own underboss would testify against him, under oath, in open court, sent shockwaves through mob circles. Lawyers didn't believe it, mobsters didn't believe it, but it's true. Ironically, Gravano was promoted from the position of consigliere, or advisor to the boss, to Gotti's underboss, so he could run the family after Gotti was in jail. Hidden FBI microphones actually recorded Gotti asking Gravano which job title he would want. So I'm asking you, how you, you want to sing this good year? Or you want me to make you official underboss, active boss, whatever you want to do? How do you feel? What makes you feel better? What made Gravano feel better after Gotti was arrested ended up not mattering too much. Gravano was arrested with Gotti. And like Gotti, he's been in jail without bail ever since. Federal sources confirmed that the FBI delivered a letter from Sammy Bull to his defense lawyer, Ben Raffman, on Friday. The letter said Raffman was fired and that Gravano would no longer need his services for the trial. I had absolutely no hand in it whatsoever. I had no advanced knowledge that he had had any contact with the government of any kind. The letter came as a complete uh, surprise and a complete shock. And uh, quite frankly, I don't know what his true status is at this time. I haven't been able to contact him. Back to the point you made. Do you think most people you know think that Gotti, that, that this is really the case against Gotti and that with this kind of testimony, notwithstanding the credibility of Gravano, uh, the conventional wisdom is that this is it? Yeah, but it's up to the jury, which yeah. is why I'm, I'm uh, quoting it so authoritatively. 88. Everybody, he's gone. I mean, it's the jury. Yeah. I don't see how you can say anything until they come in. And that, you know the experience we've all had predicting juries. Yes, you never yeah. predict what they're going to do, and you keep your mouth shut if you've got any. If you want to look smart, if you yeah. want to look dumb, go and say what they're yeah. going to do. I mean, typically we would stand in the hallway in a big case, and between the lawyers and the prosecutors yeah. and the courtroom experts, it's all settled. We yeah, would right. all we would all right. say, well, clearly these are the issues right. they're wrestling with, and right. it just hangs on that. And ultimately, when you finally talk to the jurors, it wasn't that at all. It was they they never discussed that. Yeah. You know. I, w I was thinking that I saw Lee Bailey in the courtroom yesterday. Uh, he came to Queens County. He was representing some witness, didn't he, or something? Yeah. Went, okay. He was there. He came to court in Queens County for two brothers on a murder, and the, uh, he went around the courthouse for a long time before giving out books and autographing so all the courtroom people would be formed, the marshals right. and uh, the, the uh, court officers and everything. He gets me in the hallway when the jury is coming in, and he said, we're getting a verdict, and I'm told I'm not going to like it. And the two defendants he had were very rank. We're not going to behave well, two tough guys. And he had one hand under the table when the jury came in, to, so he knew enough to follow his hand underneath the table because they were going to go nuts, the two guys with yeah. him. The guy stood up, death warmed over the jury. They were, you know, they looked, all they needed was a rope, and he said, not guilty. Bailey just went like this, he went out, <laughs> and he says, I'll never talk again as long as I live. He couldn't believe it. Yeah. So therefore, I don't see how you can uh, just stand around. As John says, you can get very smart in the hallway. Yeah. It's still the case. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like a joke. It's like an FBI guy sat down when he retired and said, I don't know, if I could have made up a case out of my head, I mean, I would have wanted a bug in his secret meeting room that was clear. I would have wanted another bug in his clubhouse. And uh, as a witness, I think... Uh, 
I'll take the underboss. Where does the defense see that they can make some inroads on this? It's very tough to cross-examine those tapes. Um, you know, they can scream all they want, they're taken out of context, but you'll get a lot further cross-examining a guy who admits to 19 murders uh, than you will with a, with a piece of tape recording. This is their big chance right now. And what is Gravano like when he talks about the murders? I mean, is it matter-of-factly? Is it just, I, I, I whacked him, I whacked him, I whacked much, him, I whacked much him. Much the way you and I would say, I waxed the car and then uh, I went to the store. And does anybody raise the question of, of how could you do that, or, or what were you thinking about? or Not the prosecutor, but you can bet the defense will. Yeah. I mean, remember, we're talking about a guy, not that John Gotti came to him and said, kill this guy, kill this guy, kill this guy. We're talking about Sammy Gravano, who killed in, in various orders uh, his best friend and brother-in-law, right. then his new best friend, Louis Melito. Right. Then, and when Louis Melito's daughter came to him and said, my father's missing. He said, if anything ever happened, if my car broke down, if I needed money, anything, and I couldn't find him to come to you. And he said, sweetheart, I'll look around for him. I'll, I'll get back to you. He, he just had... finished murdering him. Uh, Louis de Bono, his other business partner, um, uh, Frankie Batts, a member of his own crew. And why did he kill all these people? Um, three of them were business disagreements, and one of them he was concerned. The guy had started using drugs, and he thought he might be unreliable. That's his story. So uh, some of it was business, uh, some of it was personal, but uh, it was him going to Gotti and saying, I need clearance to kill these guys. Why are we so fascinated by this? And I mean, you're writing columns about it, I'm doing television programs, and John's out there covering it every day. I don't know. It, it certainly doesn't have much to do with what's going no, on. No, it doesn't, but we're all sort of captured but every, by well, this. Well, it's good. It's, it's an imitation of the movies. Yeah. You can't make a movie out of this because it's so small and tawdry. These are street corner bums, pool hall, uh, Loan sharking, crap games, uh, nothing of any. Uh, but there, that's the spirit. most incredible thing because you know and I know that these guys are bums off uh, the street. Nothing. Then when you examine it and say, who controls the carpenters union yeah. in New York? Who controlled until yeah. until recently, may still the concrete industry? Who controlled the window replacement business? Two dollars a window, billions of windows in the city. Yeah. Who controls all of these major, major businesses, the trucking industry and the garment center? Um, that is different. Those fellas are different that had uh, the trucks. The classier that's, end that's a, of the they've spectrum. They've had money for over 50 years. That, yeah, but the, the influence of the Gambinos, who, oh, who, who, plea, who plea bargained and said they'd get out of the business that's and all there, that. You're moving. So, but they're they're they're, want that. That's the what movie. You, why? But John Gotti is still their boss. Yeah. yeah. And because, he still gets a piece of the pie. Because the bottom pie. line in the business is they shoot. That's why that Sammy must have a, a, be the number two guy with Gotti, because the Gotti's afraid he'd kill him. Yeah. I guess Sammy apparently shot and killed everybody in New York except himself. Yeah, but see, the interesting thing about it is it's been brought out before. Why would Gotti choose someone? Assuming Fear. The only reason anybody does anything. Fear and also that he's a, the, yeah. obviously a bed bug, an imbecile, and he's not going to be a threat to yeah, me Yeah, but so much, here's, it's, yeah. it's still, we're talking about this kind of power that these people have. Power? Yet at the same time, when you see them and, and listen to them, they don't seem that they have the kind of, uh, of wherewithal to, no. to be that no. smart. I don't, I don't think they can run a candy store, this group. I think that the so others fear. he's talking about were the trucking with the Gambinos. These are the guys that's in the fashion district. That's, that's, another story. Up, that's another story. Uh, because the cement was Tony Salerno, which is another story, too. Right. That Tony. Yeah. But it's that's a critical another. theory, because here Tommy Gambino was on trial. Uh, it looked like he was probably going to win in that case because of the, the case dynamics. Mm. Here was John Gotti on trial, and it looked like he was probably going to mm. lose. But Tommy Gambino never even took the chance. He forks over $12 million, gives up uh, a portion of his trucking industry, takes one foot out of the garment center because I think the simple math is, wait a minute, if it's 90 to 1 that John Gotti is going away for 100 years, why do I want to be doing time even in some, sure. you know, I should be there, you know, to either in, become to the take new over boss. In, in case Gotti goes away. Right. Yeah. Or, or to yeah. get some kind of good profitable yeah. footing here. Retire What's the, into the scene. I money. read the stories of jury tampering. I mean, how do they close that opportunity down here? Oh, I don't know. Where the, how do you ever close it? There's 12 human beings They've and they know a lot of They've lost two jurors in two days. Two jurors in two days. One yeah. today. Yeah. One yeah. yesterday. Sure. Why? Uh, shrouded in yeah. secrecy, uh, this judge, Anybody. who's not a First Amendment buff, has sealed the record. 
But uh, wh what we've learned from our sources is that one juror's girlfriend kept approaching authorities uh, with her perceived fears that uh, either she was being followed or threatened or something, and they investigated it, decided that there was no substance, but they said, you know, she may upset this juror, and that may sway him. Let's pull him out. Yeah. And they did. Now, just as suddenly, another d juror disappears uh, today. He, um, you know, that person's been pulled out uh, with no explanation. So, y you see, it, it's always bubbling under the surface. You always know some. It's, uh, it's, the world is not large. If you put 12 people into a jury box, how many? 16? 18, 18, 18 now. 18 now, right? down now to there's 16. a chance. Down to 16. Down, because of these down two, to 16 right? now. Yeah. You have to figure those 16 out of the 16 somewhere, someplace, there's somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Knows somebody who knew Absolutely. somebody's grandfather, who knew somebody's mother. Absolutely. And I mean, this jury was picked from Brooklyn, from Queens, from Long yeah. Island and Staten Island, the, the, the mob's backyard, where the mob lives, in fact. Yeah. You know, if this was a Manhattan trial and they were talking about people from the East Side or Westchester, it might yeah. be different. But it's very tough to get an Eastern District jury that is unreachable unless you really lock them down, which they've pretty well done. The point you made about, uh, about Mr. Gambino, who I guess plea bargained and, and gave up some money and some yeah. whatever commitments in order to be there in the wings in case something happens to Gotti, does it make no difference if John Gotti goes down in terms of the future of organized crime? Uh, Joe Hines was here and he said there are all these stories about organized crime getting weaker are not simply not true, that they're as strong, you were here when he said it, they're as strong as they've ever been. He hung his hat on the you gambling, don't, don't that, on the gambling statistics. No. Yeah, no. I mean on that. You want? I mean, what? So they can't go into a black neighborhood. They're fat, middle-aged guys. They get wiped out in the inside of thirty seconds. You can't go into a, a black neighborhood. They can't put up with a hundred twelve-pound South American who'll kill everybody, wives, women, children. Doesn't care. That that they they, they can't do that. Where are they going to go? They've got the government on them every place else. No, I think it's a dying breed. And the gambling is what? What are they talking about? What do you mean with the gambling? That this well, is? Heinz cracked down uh, on the gambling. Remember right before the Super no, Bowl? I don't, I don't, was, I don't, that's I don't, what he that's, told me. Right? What, what he said that day was that uh, when he was in rackets uh, 15 years ago, uh, well, the gambling, right, the gambling not, take was it, X, and now it was four times. I, I don't know what the gambling take ever was. This is 1992. I think it's very, very difficult. You can't tell people from John Gotti's crew to go in, onto yeah. Uh, New York Boulevard in South Jamaica because they will not come back in good shape. Uh, so I don't know where they're going to go. I don't think they're uh, anywhere near what they were, and it's a, I think the, the losers will be the movie business. That's all. You mean you mean there'll be no more Bugsies to no, do? No, Bugsies is a, is a what? I mean they make movies out of bed bugs, but the, uh, it goes. You can't criticize. Let it go is great, but. Uh, Gotti movie, I don't know. How are you going to make a movie out of a, a somebody everybody knows? You'd have to wait 20 years. He'll yeah. be the new Capone. They'll make movies out of him 30 years. You mean we'll now. make a legend out of him yeah, when he wasn't a legend in, in his own time? That's right. He, uh, Capone yeah. died in uh, Alcatraz. This guy, yeah, uh, who knows? And they'll, yes, and they'll, they'll make a big thing out of this guy yeah. years to come. How long is this trial going to go on? I would say probably another three weeks. Yeah. I think it's happening much faster than they thought. Boy, is it ever. Yes, very fast. Yeah. Nothing like a witness that can talk a lot in one day to move <laughs> things along. Wow. Really? Uh, but, and is yeah. there general uh, a consensus that the defense attorney, without Cutler, that the defense is still strong because this guy from Miami is as good, or from Florida, is as good as they say he is? There's general consensus that John Gotti would rather have Bruce Cutler there. He said it himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Al Krieger is tiptoeing around this judge who uh, is ready to hammer any defense lawyer who crosses his line in the sand. So we haven't really seen much from Al uh, yet. Okay. Thank you both. Thank Jimmy. you. Good, Good to see you again. Pleasure. Thank you, John. Thank you too. We'll be back in just a moment. Bob Costas is here. We'll talk yeah. about baseball and a lot of Again, other things. Again, with this notion, with nature abhors a vacuum, and so does organized crime. It has been more than a year since John Gotti began serving his life sentence for murder and racketeering, but control of the Gambino crime family, according to officials, still rests with the Dapper Don. According to published reports, John Gotti retained power by installing his son, John A. Gotti as the youngest mafia boss in the United States. Call the, can all of this last? Joining me now to discuss it, Jerry Capici of the New York Daily News. He is writing a book about the fall of John Gotti. Howard Bloom, former investigative reporter for the New York Times and author of this book, Gangland. Richard Raybach, a criminal defense attorney who has defended John A. Gotti in an assault case. Later on, joining us here, John Miller of NBC Television, and we'll take a look at some video he has for a series he has been doing on this very subject. I begin with Jerry Capici. Uh, tell me what's going on. Let me, let me back up a little bit uh, and put this whole thing in context. Uh, set up organized crime 10 years ago 
and what John Gotti did in achieving the prominence he did before we talk about his fall and his son. How well, is it changing and what's happened to it? Well, I think what happened with Gotti is Gotti became the first mafia boss to beat the case, so kind of became a legend. Uh, uh, he was the only mafia boss to go to trial on racketeering charges and he beat the case. That enhanced his reputation with the public, with the mob, with law enforcement, with the media, and his ability to uh, you know, be quick with one-liners and engage uh, uh, reporters with quick one-liners. Uh, you know, I'm the boss of my wife and kids at home, things like that. You know, kind of uh, enabled him to become a, a, a folk hero in the eyes of some. It also made him a bigger target, you know, of uh, law enforcement who, you know, did everything they wanted, they, you know, wanted to do everything they possibly could to bring him down. Uh, he's a little different from the mafia bosses that uh, he uh, succeeded. Like you know. Carlo Gambino, people like that. Exactly, like Carlo Gambino, like Paul Castellano, who, uh, you know, felt the wrath of Gotti, uh, you know, and ended up being killed on uh, uh, East 46th Street. Uh, he was not the kind of guy who would hide behind the, uh, uh, the bags or the newspapers when the, f you know, photographers came by. And he was the guy who was going to fight the government no matter what they said on tape, no matter what I said on tape. I'm going to deny everything. I'm not the boss of anything. I'm the boss of my wife and kids. They're persecuting me because, you know, I'm just a different kind of guy. And that was his way of fighting, uh, fighting back and trying to beat the government. But he was clearly because of, of the prosecutions that had taken place under RICO and because, RICO statute, and also because of a lot of leaders who had, of organized crime, who'd gotten older. No question that he not only was a different type, but was the boss of all bosses within organized crime. Well, I don't think there is such a thing as a boss of all bosses anymore. One guy who controls all of organized crime throughout the country. Okay. It just doesn't exist, even in the city. I mean, what he was was the boss of the Gambino crime family, which is one of the biggest. That and the Genovese crime families are the two biggest in the city and the two biggest in the country. And they vie for the lead and, and power and influence. But he did, uh, at the time he was reigning uh, at the top, was the boss of the biggest, most powerful organized crime family in the country, no question about it. And he ended up bringing, you know, himself down uh, because he wanted uh, to make sure that everybody knew he was the boss. He insisted that all his supervisors, all his capos, all his soldiers come and pay homage to him on Mulberry Street. So what he did is he paraded all his guys into uh, Mulberry Street so that the feds could see who they were and listen to them on tape and uh, he ended up bringing down the crime family himself. All right, I'm going to come just in. I know you want to talk, Richard, but we'll get to that. Let me get Howard in here. Uh, this is a, a story that was in um, New York Magazine, uh, which is a, an excerpt from a book he's written called Gangland, How the FBI Broke the Mob by Howard Blum. And there you see at the very top of this pyramid, uh, John Gotti. How did they do it before we get to the rest of the story? Well, the FBI accomplished two things. They caught Gotti in his own words, uh, admitting to crimes, admitting to uh, participating in murders. And also, they were able to turn Sammy the Bull Gravano, uh, his number two guy, into testifying against him. Uh, they were able to turn Sammy the Bull uh, by playing a tape of uh, Gotti talking. On one of the tapes, Gotti is saying, uh, in effect, I kill all these people for Sammy, I give them all these companies, and what do I get out of it? I don't even get a good sandwich. All I want is a good sandwich. When Sammy heard this, according to the FBI, he began thinking that if Gotti ever got the sandwich, his head would be in the middle. So he began thinking, when he went back to his cell, well, I've got to whack John. And he had no problems about this. Then he decided, if I whack John, I've got to whack John Jr. I've got to whack Frankie Lowe. Whack is killing. Yes, and he made a list in his mind of all the people he'd, he'd have to kill, and he seemed to have no compunctions about this. But he real, began thinking, where would I get the time, and how could I do this before they get me? So he cut a deal with the government, and he became a witness against John Gotti. And he's continuing to testify yes, in other a, trials involving members of the Gambino family? He was in a trial this week in, uh, in Brooklyn. All right. And what will happen to him? He'll be in the witness protection program the but, rest of his life? He's about to be sentenced uh, early next year. It'd be interesting to see what's happened. He could either get time served, which is in effect no, no years, or up to 20 years. And it'd be interesting to see what the judge gives him. All right. Uh, we'll get to the question. He is now, John Gotti is in Marion in prison uh, for what, life sentence? Life, yes, without, life without parole. Right. What's his life like there? Well, I spoke last week in Boston with Tony Cardinale, who's a lawyer who's handling his appeal, one of the lawyers is handling his appeal. And uh, 
he says he visits him twice a month, and uh, he says Gotti's mood is great. Uh, he's staying in great shape, doing a thousand sit-ups uh, a day, a thousand push-ups. He's turned his bed into a stairmaster. Uh, but he says, you know, it's hard. He can't see his family. There's a, a plastic screen separating them when they come and visit. Uh, but he said his mood is great. He's, according to his lawyer, he's getting a thousand letters a month. I mean, yeah. it, it points out to the image that you made of a folk hero. Can he? direct the mob from inside prison. It's been done before, but because of all the attendant publicity to him, can't he do it? I think he's going to have a very hard time. Uh, part of the reason is his son seems to have inherited from John mostly his, his, his temper. Uh, his son, I don't think, is, is cut from the same cloth uh, as the father. The father, in many ways, uh, was or is a charismatic man, a man who understood the media. The son is as is more of a thug. It's mm. just going to be hard to do it that way. Richard, I'm coming to you. What, what else? Uh, what, how would you characterize the difference in these two people? John Gotti Jr., and known as John A. Gotti, and John Gotti? Well, uh, Junior, uh, John A. Gotti, who was referred to as Junior by the media, and I guess by, uh, and Baby Don his, by his, his gangsters, <laughs> um, he is, uh, I think it's too much too soon. I mean, he, he has whatever strength he does have right now because of his father. Uh, if, if his father were not the boss of the Gambino crime family, uh, John A. Gotti would basically not even be, a, a, well, he might not even be a made guy. Uh, so I think whatever power he has, he has because of his father. Right now it's kind of an, uh, an interesting mix or an interesting uh, phenomenon going on in the Gambino crime family. You've got seven more cases uh, coming in which Sammy Gravano is going to be a witness. So you've got the, the, a lot of the important uh, capos in the family basically kind of like just hold on to their own, see what's going to shake out, see if they're going to be convicted, see if they're going to be indicted, and kind of they're willing to let Junior uh, run the show for his father at the moment. They're, from what I get, they're not uh, giving as much tribute to the son as they gave the father. Uh, he's only 29 years old. He didn't work his way up to the position he has right now. Um, and, you know, he's kind of like looked on with a little bit of disdain by right. most Here, of the uh, People cameras. watching this want to know two things before I, go, before I go to Richard. One is, where do you get your information? Clearly you have sources within the FBI, obviously you've right. had for this book. But do, do members of organized crime talk to you? Do you have sources there who tell you what's going on? <clears throat> um, well, I get, I get my information, Charlie, from anybody who, I, who, who will talk to me. And that includes a lot of people. It includes law enforcement officials, defense lawyers, prosecutors, uh, Don't look organized, closely, cr organized crime associates, and on occasion, organized crime members. Uh, and, you know, since I've been covering organized crime with, you know, most, with regularity yes. in the last uh, five or so years, uh, I think I've developed uh, sources who tell me honestly what's going on. Because uh, they want to see the ongoing saga that you are reporting in the pages of the New York Daily News? Well, some for that reason. Some because they have a particular axe to grind against someone else and think that uh, they're being jobbed or given a, a bum rap for some reason and want me to get what they consider to be the straight scoop. I think the reason why I'm able to function pretty much uh, uh, the way I do uh, with kind of a, what I consider grudging respect from the organized crime guys I write about is because I will take shots at the government when they screw up and when I feel that they've done something that they shouldn't be doing. I mean, uh, Richard Raybach can speak to that later. But I think uh, there is a tendency by many reporters and many uh, TV um, uh, reporters, uh, print, uh, and r television, and radio, to kind of like take what the government gives and just yeah. spit it out without double checking. I think for the most part, the government, the uh, FBI, uh, uh, cops do a good job and, you know, are honest. But they do uh, screw up on occasion. Occasionally they trample on people when they shouldn't. And I try to, uh, you know, point the difference. Ever talk to John Gotti? Uh, except for, uh, you know, quick, the quick hallway stuff. No, uh, John Gotti, I don't think, would ever agree to an interview from anyone. Uh, anyone? Uh, from anyone. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I think all the so interviews far. you've... So, so far. far. So far. I mean, I think John Gotti, you know, I think it's looking to a whole new future. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, Sammy Bull is, is now thinking about doing a, a book. Uh, I spoke with Sammy Bull, I guess it was uh, late last summer. The FBI put me in touch with right. him. And he came out and said at the end of the conversation, you guys, meaning reporters, are a lot worse than anything I've ever been. And he killed 19 people. So, you know, that, that's one view, mob view of the press. Also, the FBI you know, is an interesting organization. They don't seem to uh, 
be in control of the situation very often. Uh, I, uh, to do my book, Gangland, got permission from the FBI to speak to all the people involved. Uh, now that the book has been published as a new FBI director, uh, Director Free, right. he's now ordered the Office of Professional Responsibility. Well, that's nonsense. Uh, that's, but, I, I, that's nonsense. That, uh, if I can continue. <laughs> right, I'll come back to the nonsense in a minute. Uh, Stand by, Richard. It's unbelievable I've stayed quiet this I know, long. I know, but I'm going to give you a long time. He's ordered the Office of Professional Responsibility to begin investigating uh, you know, what agents talk to me, and, and he's, they've, they've interviewed prosecutors. I, in fact, got two calls from the FBI office myself, from uh, Joe Valaket of the FBI, uh, which, uh, and he wanted to know, did I speak to a specific agent? Did a specific agent give me specific information? I mean, so they're really turning the, the screws on men who are heroes. Jerry, what, what's nonsense? Well, uh, I think, I, I've said publicly before that I think the book is a fraud. And written uh, publicly. And written publicly, I think the book is a fraud. Uh, just to, to I, was co I was in one of the trials that Sammy Gravano was testifying at this week, and I spoke to three of the four, three FBI agents who are in a specific scene that Mr. Bloom writes about in his book, and every one of them told me it was a lie flat out. So he's got four people in a scene well, here. Uh, that's they're tell telling you. I'm not lie. so sure that's so accurate. Three and again, why would they be investigating and the book if it, if it were inaccurate? And I, I think what the, what the guy has done is crafted a book that he thought would be a, a big seller and that he thought would be great for the movies. You know, if but you want to get... you're not accusing him of being deliberately dishonest. Oh, of course he... <laughs> yes, I am. All right. He's lied throughout the book, like right. I've said publicly uh, before. Like I said publicly before. I mean, he says, for example, that there are 3,000 members of the Gambino crime family. That's a joke. You know, How many? Readers, there's about 200. You have the, you have the count of them all. They all call Jerry every day. Readers, readers call. Digest called me up and said, Jerry, we realize that you've got this, you know, problem with gangland, but we're excerpting it, and we're doing a, a couple of pages on this book, and could you help us with all the inaccuracies and corrections and what? I said, listen, I don't want to be your fact checker. He said, please, please. Uh, he says, the FBI said, I mean, it's, everybody knows Jerry, that the Jerry, I'm going to give Howard the last, last word on this before. <laughs> I mean, the bottom line to this whole Howard dispute. Howard Bloom, before we move on, because I want to get Richard, uh, as okay, I promised in The bottom line to this whole dispute. I'm sure you are. Gentleman. We're getting, getting right to you. I mean, yeah. the bottom line to this whole dispute between Jerry and I is that uh, he's upset that he's written books that don't sell. He's upset that they're making my book <laughs> into a movie. I mean, you know, is Jerry is in red with indignation. <laughs> I really think he's green with envy. And I'm sorry, Jerry, I, you know, if I can give you two free tickets to the movie premiere, we'd be glad to have you there. I don't have to lie about my age. I don't have to lie about what college I went to. Like oh, Jerry, you twist so many and facts around. It's ridiculous. And I don't have to really Jerry, just ridiculous. worry about him. I, I, don't, I said that Your before when you asked so me to come on. so many inaccuracies, but also that it's also boring to read. <laughs> we can't settle this here, although I, it's fascinating television and fascinating dialogue, uh, but I want to get to Richard, as I promised. You've been listening to this, not the most recent part, but including the most recent part. How many members do you think there are in the Gambino family, oh, for example? Okay. Charlie, I'm not going to get into that. And I'll tell you, you know, the, my response to... To what's been said so far about John your, Gotti, John Gotti, son. My response to your question, and, and obviously those are the questions that are always asked of uh, lawyers who have been on various cases. And, what you know, questions? All this stuff about how many members do you believe or something. I mean, Who's in you know, control? There are, there's one Who's of the in? oldest lessons we, uh, we learned in the law, and that is... Uh, compound questions, assuming facts, not in evidence. That's the lawyer's talk. The classic example is uh, the question, how many times do you beat your wife? I mean, that presumes you beat your wife. Questions like that are exemplified by what's going on with these two gentlemen right here. They both write books. Neither of us beat our wives. I'm the only one who here who's not writing a book. Well, no, that's not true. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm not writing a book. No, I mean amongst yeah. your guests. Yeah. Uh, right. It's interesting, and Jerry made uh, you know, a, a good approach at uh, publicizing the fact that he is writing a book in this area, and he's talking about you know, his notices. Mr. Blum writes a book, ostensibly, uh, I notice, uh, steals his uh, column name. So, you know, there's going to be an antipathy back here about who's right, accurate right, but get on to the point. I, don't, I, want, I want you to tell me the what... The point you, is, you well... You know John A. Gotti? Yes, I represented did. John A. Gotti. Yes, I did. Tell me about him. Tell me about him. He's a young man who, quite frankly, is struggling very hard to run businesses that are quite legitimate and has many troubles every day with harassment by law enforcement agencies going to people who he has contracts with to do service and 
they telling him the litany of stories who you're dealing with? Has you know, this country has he succeeded his father as head of the Gambino family? Who says that? I'm asking. James that. Fox, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I'm a defense lawyer. I practice criminal law. When somebody's arrested for a crime, I represent them. I ensure their rights are yeah. taken care of. And I do everything in my power, fight as hard as I can to make sure that a, that a person has a fair trial, an even slate. What's going on here is an interesting situation. Where? In, at this table. This table and out in the world. We have a law enforcement agencies. You asked about sources. Law enforcement agencies feeding material to gentlemen such as these, to newspaper article writers, columnists, television personalities, Mr. Miller included, who are feeding them information not here yet. as telltale anonymous sources, unnamed law enforcement official, putting out the straight poop in their words for what purpose? You know, if Mr. Fox or some of the... Let me finish this, Charlie. If Mr. Fox or some of these people are going to put out a propaganda campaign and try these cases in the papers and on television, what are they doing it for? Are they doing it to ensure fairness? Are they doing it to back up their own professionalism? Or are they doing it to send a message and virtually condition the public as to a set of facts specific set of facts. Why are they doing that? All right, well, let me turn to Jerry. That's a real question. Uh, Jerry Capisi. John Gotti was convicted fair and square. I mean, what, what uh, bugs me... I don't me, think anybody... Bugs, what, bugs That's me ridiculous. About, what bugs me about some of the uh, stuff you hear from some defense lawyers, and Richard right now, is that they disregard what has happened. I mean, John, you know, when John Gotti was acquitted in 1987, Everybody was uh, ranting and raving about how, you know, a courageous jury stood up and acquitted him and rah, rah, rah. Now that he's been convicted and his appeal has been uh, affirmed, uh, has been rejected, and his conviction was affirmed, I think it's about time for the defense bar and everybody to understand that John Gotti was the boss of the Gambino crime family. He was a gangster. Uh, he killed 11 people. That's what the testimony was at the trial. And that, you know, he's got away in jail for the rest of his life, and he was as properly so. Okay. And in 87, wait, 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 hold on one second, second. Richard. Let, let Howard tell me that for It was because the juror had been bought. The foreman of the jury had been bought for $60,000. Oh, that's a lot of crap, and everybody the guy knows has, that. The guy has been convicted no. for that. No, he wasn't convicted of that. And if you get your facts straight, you know... You he know. wasn't convicted of that? What no. was he convicted well, of? Who was convicted you of what? You get your facts straight, that's not correct. <clears throat> a juror at the first trial was convicted of... Uh, Taking a $60,000 uh, bribe. Soliciting, and soliciting, and soliciting on his own. Bribe and soliciting and on his own. Two people. Yeah. This no is a person who the government's version... We're I've never met this person. No, I'm not yeah. almost No, agreeing. Jerry and I. A little... A great distinction. You know, the, the story that comes out by some of these writers about that first trial is that people reach the jury. Mm -hmm. That's the big story. That's the way the government wants to put it out because they have to make themselves whole again but because the they had a lousy case. Right. They had a lousy no case. All right, but you know the, All right. stop, 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 stop. Uh, no, no, he was not convicted of what you said. He was convicted of... The Richard, I'm not going to argue this point and, and eat up any more time. John Miller is not here, but we do have the tape, I think. Just so you can see some of the faces that go with some of the story, here is John Miller's piece on, from WNBC Television here in New York. As we watched, John Gotti Jr. came to the Bergen Club each day. Being the acting boss, and that's what the FBI says he is, he derives his power from his father, who will remain boss in jail. But that makes Jr. the street boss the youngest in history. That means between visits to his father once a month in Marion prison, he calls the shots. Everywhere I go, you're there. Yeah, is it true that you're the new boss of the Gambino crime Absolutely family? Absolutely not. I'm the boss of my wife and my children. While his lawyers insist all his businesses are legit, when he needs to make certain phone calls, he has one of the workmen drive him to a pay phone. Maybe with all the work going on at the house, they haven't gotten around to installing the phone yet. Sure he's not a mob boss? He lives a relatively simple life. He does go to his businesses, follow him around and see who he sees. We did follow him. Each day we tailed him, John A. Gotti, trucking and auto parts entrepreneur, went straight to the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. 
and he hung out there with Fat Sally Scala, allegedly a hitman in the Castellano murder, and others like Georgie Brooklyn, Jimmy Irish, Tommy Sneakers, Jackie Cavallo, and Charlie Carnelia, two allegedly made members of the Gambino crime family. And when the young reputed Don goes for a ride, Carnelia becomes his driver. Oh, and don't try to follow them. They hate that. According to the FBI, when John Gotti made his son a soldier in the family, he was one of the youngest ever. And when he promoted him to captain or capo, he gave him his own club and his own crew. And that offended a lot of old timers. I think he has a problem about maintaining whatever power he has. Our feeling is if he would step down gracefully, he could probably remain alive. If he refuses to do so, uh, he, he may see that there's going to be violence uh, in store. Our thanks to John Miller and WNBC for allowing us to use that tape, which gave you some sense of, of the pictures that match the names that are in action and in play here. Late last month, Guardian Angels found that Curtis Lee was suffered multiple gunshot wounds in a planned attempt on his life. Today's New York Post reports that the self-appointed crime fighter has identified the shooters as associates of John Gotti, Jr., son of the convicted mafia boss. He joins us now with his story. Also here is WNBC News reporter John Miller, who covers organized crime and who first showed Sliwa mugshots of the purported assailants, and we'll hear more about that later. I want to welcome both of you to this broadcast. Tell me what led to this story in the New York Post. Well, as you remember, back on June 19th, I had been shot while getting into a cab heading up to a morning radio show that I host with my wife, Lisa, for WABC. And I've gone through this routine many, many times from my apartment uh, right near Tompkins Square Park in the Lower East Side. Hit the candy store on 7th Street, raise, sometimes get an A cream. Right. If it's good, you have a good day. If it's lousy, you have a lousy day. And then flag a cab. It's exactly what I did, except this time a cab had passed me earlier, went down towards the club trying to hail a, f uh, hail a fare. Right. And then as I came out with the tabloids, I held it down. They popped a Yui picked me up, and I assumed I was going to WABC upon instructions, but they ended up veering off, and then immediately a gunman popped up in the front seat on the passenger side, had few words to say, take this, you son of a bee, with a mask and an Irish walking cap on, yeah. and then began a series of shots as I desperately tried to break out of the back of the cab, which had been jerry-rigged. Doors wouldn't open, right. windows wouldn't open, and after a series of shots striking me in the legs and the stomach, I was able to dive through a front window that he had left open on the passenger style while the car was racing fast down Avenue B. And apparently he put a final shot in my back just before I tumbled out and the yeah. cab uh, held away. Saved your life by doing that. Well, luckiest guy in the yeah. world. Had yeah. to be somebody upstairs looking out for me. Why do you think he didn't kill you? Was he a bad shot? No. Uh, he was a professional, cool, calm, collected. He was aiming but his he, shots. But he had you right there in the back of the taxi. Yeah, but it doesn't happen like in the movies. I'm not talking I, about I, the movies. I'm talking about that close a shot with that kind of weapon and with you sitting there. Well, maybe he should have gone to the rifle range and the uh, pistol range for more target practice. But yeah. when you're in that particular situation and you have that immediate x lax attack and your right. whole life passes before you and you're bouncing around trying to avoid getting a headshot, uh, it's very difficult to play Monday morning quarterback. You do what you have to do. If he wasn't able to take you out, then you look for the only possible way out of there to save your life. Okay, but then I want to come to this story. You, then you, let me pick this story up as far as I know it. You two came together at the Garden during the Democratic National Convention. Right. And you said what? I said, how's it going with your case? You know, what do you hear? What do you know? And Curtis said, uh, nothing's happening. And, uh, you know, they don't know who did it. And I said, everybody has an idea of who did it. Yeah. And, and meaning a whole bunch of different ideas, but no, no nobody. I there was had no, one specific idea. Yeah, uh, I I had heard from the day of the shooting, and and uh, then uh, more strongly on since the shooting, that uh, they were really looking at the associates of John Gotti um, and John Gotti's son. This was the word the on the street. This was the word on the street, and this was something the police had looked into that the FBI was looking into. Okay, and so what happened then? You said to Curtis, let's get together, or let's have lunch, or let's... I said, as you know, has anybody reported this as it's developed? And he said no, and I said, well, after the convention, we'll get together and I'll look into it. So you did get together, and you did what? 
Um, first, I, I uh, went through the names of uh, who was being looked into, and um, then based on my knowledge of these people, um, I picked out two people uh, that I had information on were being looked at uh, very strongly, and um, I showed Curtis uh, the photos over lunch. And, and uh, one he uh, kind of ruled out as being too young to be the driver, and the other said he had a, a very good feeling about as the gunman, but because the gunman wore a, a kerchief, a mask from here, and a hat from here, yeah. and, uh, he got a very narrow view of the face, and therefore told me I can't positively identify him. But then the next morning you get up and you see this, the New York Post. Next morning I see in the Post he says, a shiver went down my spine, I look at the guy and I know he's the guy that shot me. But it's not what he said to you? No, or what the police say he said to them. What goes here, Curtis? Well, after John Miller shows me the two photos, suddenly the uh, Ninth Precinct, which uh, hadn't really been following any concrete leads, brings me six photos that they say uh, John Gotti Jr. Uh, follow-ups, you know, uh, people who are cohorts of his, and they're only responding because I've been informing them of what John Miller has told me and keeping them abreast. I haven't kept them in the dark about John Miller. They show me the photo this time, I have the sketch next to it. Remember, I had done a sketch right. based on my description the week earlier with the mask, with the Irish walking cap. I said, look, I got a strong feeling on this guy. I'm looking at his face. This is the shooter, but I got to see him in the Irish walking cap and in the mask to be for sure. And they said, well, you know, that's not necessarily the ID you got to give. You got to give an ID of a guy without a mask and a walking cap. They leave. And the very next day when uh, John Miller does his uh, actual uh, TV uh, program on it, he puts the facsimile of uh, the Stephen Kaplan, the guy I had pointed to as being the uh, possible shooter, and then I put in, as I freeze frame it, the Irish walking cap from the sketch, and also the mask, and I go bingo, that's the guy you who shot You go bingo, me. you said it sent shivers down my spine? No. That, no that, that was earlier with John? That was a quote that I've said consistently about seeing this guy in my dreams each and every night, and every time I'm fixated on the face and the first shots, it sends a, spine, a shiver down my spine from the tip of my toes to the tip of my nose. Roll tape. Take a look. at This is a piece that John Miller did for WNBC television New here York in New City York. New York City police are looking into a group of young men connected to John Gotti, Jr. Curtis Lewa has been shown photos of about 15 members of young Gotti's crew. If there is any validity to this theory, why would the son of a powerful mob boss take out a contract on the high-profile leader of the Guardian Angels? In appearances on talk shows like Jackie Mason's show and on Nine Broadcast Plaza, Sliwa again and again has disparaged John Gotti and did what intimates of John Gotti say irks him the most. He's called him a drug dealer. They've obviously got some problem with the audio up there, need to up the channel, whatever the problem is. We, we, the essence of that piece was... The essence of that piece was Chief of Detectives Joseph Pirelli saying, we are looking into the possibility that uh, the Gotti people were connected to this. We are doing that because of Sliwa's public statements about Gotti, and we've shown him photos, but he can't identify anyone because of the mask. Does the police believe that, th that there is some truth to this story, that somehow Gotti's people might have been somebody associated with the Gotti family, may have something to do with this, may know about this, may have been involved? Well, they certainly believe it enough to have done an investigation, collected the pictures, shown them to Curtis, um, yeah. and, and checked with all of their informants, and then borrowed the FBI's informants uh, at least long enough to have the Bureau put the same question out. So, I mean, they, they, they've gone down the road on this, on this lead. Um, are they locked into it? No. Frankly, uh, they're looking for other avenues to pursue, but while this is the only significant one left, they're playing it out. And what are the Gotti people saying? The Gotti people say uh, that they had nothing to do with it. Yeah, and they say it longer, louder than that, don't they? Yeah, they do. <laughs> That's not exactly the language they would they, use. They, 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 <laughs> they, actually, I spoke to uh, one of the people today out by one of the clubs. And they who, said, oh, uh, John, it was not something we would do. He said, uh, this guy, speaking of Curtis, uh, uh, bad mouths 900,000 people. Suddenly, we're the bad guys. Why are we the bad guys? Yeah. Any quarrel you have with this story, Curtis? Oh, the quarrel is well, some of the... overplay it in your oh, judgment? Well, hey, it's a front page headline. Yeah. And uh, they indicate that there were two individuals that I fingered when, as John Miller knows and the police know, I clearly ruled out the one person. They have a photo of an individual and the wrong name under it. 
But I under hey, you live in New York City. It's tabloid war. You don't always get it right. I have a radio show. I'm not always right. I'm not going to point fingers. But in terms of my belief for the Gotti Jr. people involved, yes, emotionally. Why? What was the motive? Well, remember, for months on end, while the Gotti trial was unfurling, John Gotti Sr. was being made into this heroic George Washington type figure. Bruce Cutler would have this guy become mayor of New York City. And we being made into it by whom? By the public. The public was okay. buying into it. 60, 70 percent felt he was being shafted, that he was really a John, Dotty, a John Gotti the good. Yet I know better because I'm out there in the streets and I'm battling against the drug dealers on the corners. But I'm not going to be blinded to the fact that if you're the leader of organized crime, you're bringing in pounds, you're bringing in kilos, you're overseeing organized crime. You're becoming a role model for the Nino Browns who are stars in uh, you know, Crack City, USA, for the Tony Montanas and Scarface. Everybody in the criminal world wants to be like G John Gotti, his own brother, doing 50 years for distribution and sale of heroin. And don't tell me he's not involved in drugs. You can't be involved in organized cr uh, crime without having your okay, feet well, and your arms deep Connect in the that to trade. a motive to kill you. Well, an emotional reaction on the part of the son, whose furniture is uh, upstairs but rearranged in the wrong rooms, who's known to be a real uh, firecracker when it comes to emotional but responses. But why you? I mean, what was it you were doing that was a threat to them or would cause them to go... Well, nothing to affect their business directly. I'm just a flea on a dog because the kind of drug dealers I'm dealing with are predominantly in the black and Hispanic inner city neighborhoods. But the fact that I would continue to speak on the radio, on television, that First Amendment right of free speech sometimes can do a lot of damage. And people in the past have paid for their right of free speech. Remember, I was attacked twice within three months under the same types of circumstances in what appears to be a very organized way of trying to either silence me hurt me and in the last case put me six feet under in a pine box. Yeah. What, um, what do you think the motive would be? I, I, through my own experience, know that the one thing that drives the Gotti people crazy, despite the fact that Gene Gotti, John's brother, is doing 50 years in a heroin case, is when you call Gotti a drug dealer. Um, when I've talked about his connections to narcotics, uh, he's been very sensitive about it and he sent feelers back uh, saying that he was displeased. When a book was written that connected him heavily to narcotics trafficking, uh, his people badmouthed uh, that book, Gumbada, right. um, very strongly. That is the nerve that he doesn't like touched because his take on all of this is that he's in, uh, behind victimless, victimless crimes and that he cleans up neighborhoods of street criminals and pushers. And he was putting that out every day during the right. trial, and Curtis was saying the opposite at the same time. Well, I think it's important, Charlie, to say we had Mario Cuomo, governor of the state in 1986, say there's no such thing as the mafia, la cosa nostra, the black hand. I'm part Italian-American. It's important for each person in an ethnic or racial group to point out the negatives in their group. Not like the Dominicans in Washington Heights who say, oh, we don't have drug dealers here, or the Italians who say there's no mafia. Purge ourselves of our negative elements, acknowledge who they are, and join together to clean the city of crime. You can't just do it with the guys on the corners. You got to go into the ivory towers. You got to go into the suits and into the suites and deal with the people who are bringing it in. And that's what organized crime does. Bring it in. Who else is bringing it in? We'll come back to that. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Uh, we're back. Curtis Lee was here and John Miller. John Miller's been on this broadcast a number of times and, and has helped us understand Gotti and organized crime and, and has won a lot of awards and a lot of attention because of what he's done on WNBC television in New York as well as NBC News with Tom Brokaw. You're not happy about this and you're being a little bit gentle with Curtis. And my impression is that, that you have stronger feelings than you're telling us. My problem is that when we all went to bed last night, we had the Gotti people with a motive to hurt Curtis, right. Curtis's outspokenness. We had uh, some people in that group who basically fit the description and had a known propensity through their criminal records of assault and assault and assault for this type of violence. The first attack on Curtis was done with baseball bats. That's their style. The second attack was done with an attack car, a hitman with a gun, an incompetent hitman, albeit and uh, a second getaway car, a Lincoln town car that headed to Brooklyn. This all has the organized crime taste to it, mm -hmm. by my experience. Um, and, and we put that story out with the police confirming that they were following those leads and investigating that angle. Curtis couldn't identify the photos I showed him. Right. He couldn't identify the photos the police showed him. Yet next day, as it explodes into the newspaper headlines out, out of this TV story, Curtis is, is giving the impression in these quotes, or these quotes give the impression that Curtis said clearly that he made a positive identification and that the police won't go arrest these guys. 
What I'm saying is he took a legitimate story and then adopting his own spin control for the guardian angels' propaganda. And the guardian angels are a good thing. Um, he sent it out of the ballpark. Uh, I am tied deeply to reality in my role as a reporter. I hate to, to go so far from it. And, and Curtis has kind of dragged the story out of the realm. All right, now, is this Curtis doing this because he wants to be on the front page of the New York Post? or uh, Ask him. Well, I'm there. asking you what you think first. I, I have the feeling that, that Curtis liked the sound of the story and believed it. And so he, and then he exaggerated it himself further. or the reporter misunderstood? or. Well, one reporter can misunderstand in the Post, but I mean the same quotes are generally in the Times Curtis, and the News. Curtis, explain yourself. Oh, it's very simple. He shows me a photograph. I say, this is a familiar face. This looks like the shooter. I need to see this guy with obviously the handkerchief on and the Irish walking cap. I say the same thing to the police more than eight hours later. They're more upset at the fact that John Miller has had the pictures before they've been able to show me the pictures. So at that point, they're a bit wasted. I then go about artificially placing the Irish walking cap the next day and the handkerchief on the face of the individual who I see on TV. It all clicks. That guy is the shooter as far as I'm concerned. So you're saying you reacted differently, more emphatically, because there were different oh, sure. circumstances, John, you buy that? As you sit here now, are you saying that having told me you really can't identify the guy because the guy had a big mask on and told the police the same thing, as you sit here tonight, are you saying that guy in that picture is definitely the gunman? My gut reaction is that the picture you showed me that you identified as Steve Kaplan, who I never saw before, is the man in the mask and the cap who shot me. Shot me. Now, I've been told by ninth uh, precinct detectives that they cannot go on that because there's a mask. So ultimately, no matter who I identify, if I looked at a million pictures, it would come to the same conclusion. How do you know what was below the mask? But there are certain instinctual gut reactions you get when you've been on the streets for many, many years and you got to go for it. I'm sorry if I've offended uh, uh, any of the reporters out there by reactor, reacting in a guttural fashion, out of the gut. That's the way I've been able to survive for 13 years. How do you think I was able to survive these two attacks? By intellectualizing? No, by basing it on my instinct, my intuitive nature, and a gut reaction. If I've offended anybody, if I've interfered with the process that the detectives must go through, I apologize. But you know something? I'm fighting for my life here. If it hadn't been for this guy, it would have never spun in that direction. Because every time I'd mention Cougines, hitters from South Ozone Park and Howard Beach, the cops would put a spin and say, no way. We're not even going in that direction. Well, you're saying that they did entertain those ideas, are you not? I'm saying when I would ask around on, on both levels of the investigation, who do you like here, and are you looking at this Gotti thing? They're like, we've been through everybody we like, and we're still looking at the Gotti thing. So to me, it was the last live they circle lead. around and come back there. Yeah. Yeah. But you're saying that, what, that the precinct, you didn't think they were doing their job? I mean, you, you and, and other guardian angels, including your wife, have not had positive things to say about them, well, have let's, you? Well, let's remember, and John, you, you remember the second day, I'm in intensive care on my back. I got six bullet holes in me. I've got every person sending every religious item plus, uh, you know, garlic around in my... the last rites. <laughs> right. It's Santa Ria Priestess, yeah, Haitian right. Voodoo. Yeah, Everybody's trying to help me. And what they gets, think you're on your way. What gets published in this newspaper on a different day, Curtis Lee was shot as a result of love triangle. Right. Police sources say, my buddies, the NYPD out of one police plaza, made it appear that I was having a, an estrangement with my wife, Lisa, which was not true, and that some third person was involved in a triangle. And they suggested the reason that you were shot the way you were was because it was somebody who was doing it out of that motivation rather than an attempt to kill you. And having been around the block for many years, you know when you throw mud out, if it sticks, people start coming out of the woodwork, particularly with that high profile. You know how much time they lost in the investigation because of that garbage? No. It didn't come from John Miller. It didn't come from a gossip columnist, Cindy Adams. It didn't come from a street person. It came from the NYPD. And I will never, ever forgive them for that indiscretion because it slowed down the progress of that case and it was pure garbage, total garbage. John, help me out here. The, the problem I have is, is not with the love triangle thing or what police sources said. I mean, did, were there police people who believe that, police officials or, or officers that believe that there may be some merit to that story? They had some trouble in their minds with the story because I was, I was checking into the Curtis shooting With the story as the a beginning. planned hit rather than a... Well, I mean, they, their problem is that, that they don't have witnesses. And then, and then the one witness that they do have has Curtis getting into the cab and talking with the two individuals, which isn't exactly consistent with his story, because they see two people in the front of the cab. Curtis's version of the shooting has the gunman pop up from under the front seat and start shooting. And they have the shots going off in a different place. 
Now, witnessing a shooting at 5 o'clock in the morning is an art unto itself. You've got to expect there's going to be inconsistencies. But w based on their experience with Curtis, which is attacks and, you know, publicity attached to them and an agenda and a, and a political guy and, w and a witness who's got an inconsistent version of the shooting with Curtis, and then, and then the, the questions that they have to struggle with, how does a guy get past a hefty gunman over the seat of a taxi and out the front window? I simply answer that by saying, oh, when you're being shot at point blank, there's a lot of motivation to make things move. Get to, the heck out of there. Yeah. But, I mean, they grapple with how can he fit and how could he have moved the guy and how could he have gotten out the front window. And So, I mean, they're grappling with the story. So, of course, they're looking for another angle. They're looking for an angle they're comfortable with, one that makes sense because this one doesn't. Well, often reality doesn't make sense. Um, so they were searching for a way around that. But, John... It's just this kind of conduct, though. After... After he says he can't identify a gunman to say, I positively identified and the cops won't lock them up. When this appears in newspaper stories, whether Curtis said it or not, you have to put yourself in a police mindset, which is, there he goes again. Right, but, but, yeah, but go ahead. I'm to depend on the NYPD that for 13 years has treated me like a hemorrhoid in a red beret, was trying to find Preparation H to wipe us out. There's still bad blood in some sectors of the department, and they were not hassling the gaudy people. They were not going in with the organized crime guys and tossing and turning them as if a police officer had been killed. Now, I'm not saying I'm on the equal level, but when you have a citizen crime fighter who heads an international organization who's whacked on twice within three months, Man, something's got to start shaking and baking. My life is at stake, and nobody at NYPD or One Police Plaza seems to be able to uh, put this together. If they can't put it together, who's going to put it? You had more information than they did. How can that be? A reporter yep. has more information on who it is that may have done the hit than the NYPD. But you reacted more aggressively to their information than you did to his information. Absolutely, because he was the one who first showed it to me, and then when I could look at it with the circumstance of the, of the hat and naturally the scarf, it all fit together. Okay, now you've heard his explanation as to what happened. When he, does it, do you buy it? Does it make sense to you? Is it, is it okay, real I'm, and I'm rational? Okay, I'm very comfortable in my position on, the, on this whole thing, which is I, I stick with my story that that was the angle police were investigating, and I know those people in that crew. This is their style. Okay, so we know it's being investigated and we know it fits their history. This is where I stop. I also know that Curtis didn't make an ID with me, although he said he had a strong feeling about one of the guys and that he didn't with the police. I, I think, I think when, it, when it leaves this point, it's out of my control. The yeah. ball has left my glove here. <laughs> and then I think all of the politics and, and the assorted yeah. uh, rivalries yeah, between Curtis's people and the right. police take on a life of their own. And not, the story gets away. Let's not forget. If a third time happens and I get killed, it's a three-day story, and then this is around a dead fish, and I'm a forgotten person. Curtis, if you get killed, the story runs at least a week and yeah, a half. Yeah, but the point is, I'm Ten dead. Days. No, no, you're not a three-day story. It's Six be okay. feet under in a pine box, and quite frankly, when your life is on the line, and now you hear footsteps, and suddenly you're no longer the invincible person, the untouchable that you were for 13 years, it puts a whole different slant on things. And when people are laughing and cackling about what they may have done to you, you've got to defend yourself. You don't pin it on an innocent man. But when all roads lead to a certain okay. group of people... Let me wrap this up. What are you going to do now, Curtis? Well, obviously, I have to travel very safely. Watch my back, be followed by an entourage constantly. Continue. What's interesting is he'll still say those things about the Gotti crew with it in his mind that they did this because he was saying that. Well, there's, there's no... Uh, it's suggesting what, though? Suggesting he's fearless or suggesting what else? Suggesting that he's fearless or foolish, yeah. uh, depending on how There's you look no at it. There's no Kool-Aid that pumps through my veins. I stick to what I've said about John Gotti Sr., John Gotti Jr. If Kaplan is not... As the people involved in drugs. Uh, absolutely. Right. I mean, anybody would know that. That's organized crime. How else does drugs come into this country? You think those black and Hispanics on right. the street corners of, of uh, Harlem and Washington Heights bring pounds and kilos in? Yeah. Do you think this kind of story makes any difference? What does it do for you? What the story does for me is it sort of puts uh, me in the field of reality that if this organization is to continue to grow internationally as we have, uh, I'm going to have to start looking after myself, my wife, my family, the extended guardian angel family so that we can take this into the next decade and perpetuate it and turn it into a mainstream organization. Have you gotten any community, had any other threats that people said, look, we're going to finish off what we did or anything like that? Oh, well, you know, you're, it's a walking, talking magnet for threats. You're like a Velcro man. But the threats in this direction are far more serious because for the first time, a professional aura 
over the hit, over the attack took place, and everybody had a gut reaction that it was organized crime. Now, that doesn't mean that it was, but when you have that emotional, guttural reaction, you've got to go with your Are instinct. you convinced the three attacks are connected? Absolutely. Well, the two attacks. I mean, the two attacks, yeah. Absolutely. No question about it in my mind. Yeah, that who did the first did the second. Oh, it's like a, a, a soup and a sandwich, a horse and a carriage, yeah. like two peas in a pod. And anybody who disagrees hasn't been around a block yeah. a few times. But you could also suggest that you got a lot of enemies. A lot of people would like to see you hurt. A Rolodex full right. from A to Z, and they come in all racial groups, all descriptions, all backgrounds. Okay. But the only thing different in my past 13 years has been the six months on the case of John Gotti Sr. destroying this myth of John Gotti the Good when he's been John Gotti, the evil one. They're going to come down and start his car, right? <laughs> hey, Charlie, well, you want some word. Come on. <laughs> John Miller, Curtis Lever, thank you very much. Are you doing the radio show? Are you back on the radio? Oh, back on the radio with my wife, Lisa, okay. and giving her agita. I think she needs to go to the hospital now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both. When we return, one of popular music's most enduring talents, Peggy Lee, back in a moment. In October 1991, Sammy Gravano sat in a federal prison with his boss, John Gotti, and thought about his options, staying loyal to a man he feared was about to betray him, or cooperating with the authorities to save himself. The following year, Sammy the Bull Gravano became the highest ranking mafia member to testify against his own. Although in the years since the trial he has been in hiding, there was at least one person in contact with him, author Peter Moss, whose previous books include Serpico and the Valachi Papers. The new book, Underboss, is the result of his interviews with Gravano, and it is generating a lot of attention and a lot of controversy and top-rated television programs. I'm pleased to have Peter Moss join us this evening. Welcome, sir. Delighted to be with you, Charlie. It's good to have you. As always. Well, tell me... Are you surprised about the reaction to this? This week, primetime television, primetime live, the highest rated show of the evening included an interview, Diane Sawyer, Gravano, you included, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it about this story that's so compelling to people? And B, are you surprised? Well, I think, uh, first of all, Hollywood creates our myths, and uh, for many, many years the western was the great american myth and then with the um, the godfather saga the the mafia itself replaced the western as uh, something of intense interest i think the american public so i think that there's a fascination you know and the westerns always ended up with the shootout yeah black versus always, white and all that there was a violent death always waiting in the wings and uh, the mafia supplied the same thing mm. and the and uh, certainly the godfather um the Godfather uh, created this kind of romantic image, glamorous mm. image, and uh, and John Gotti uh, picked that up uh, pretty fast. Uh, I think he conducted himself, he looked, and he dressed just like Americans wanted a gangster to look and act like. Almost as if out of Hollywood. Right, exactly. Do you know whether John Gotti has seen or read the book? No, I haven't. Uh, I, I think he's in prison. I think a bookstore has to send it to him. I, I don't think he can. Yeah, but people who know him, correspond with him, might want to send it out there. <clears throat> I am sure he's going to say he hadn't read the book, and I'm also sure that he will read it. Or <laughs> has already read it. I don't know, because this book was under heavy embargo. Um, as a matter of fact, I did not get a copy. One copy last Friday night, that's a week ago. Uh, three days before it was uh, 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 to be published, uh, they, there was real security. There were no review copies, no anything, but uh, you're right, it's selling pretty good. Why is it going to be on the New York Times bestseller this, this weekend, or do you no, know it's it? too quick. It takes two weeks, okay. Yeah. Uh, why you? How did you end up with this opportunity to do this book? Well, what happened was this. He was in the witness protection program, and apparently a great number of writers wrote to him uh, through the U.S. Marshal Service, uh, asking to work with him on a book, and as told to, I don't know what they said. I didn't read the letters. I know there were a lot of them. And I, I think that's when he really started thinking about the possibility of a book, and he asked a friend, a trusted friend, for some recommendations, and I was recommended. Did you know the friend that made the recommendations? Yes, slightly. Not okay. well. And a made man? No, 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 not a made man. A woman, actually. Yeah. And uh, uh, he had read the Valachi papers, and uh, he was sent Killer Spy, my last book about older James, right. and he loved it. And 
So a meeting was arranged. Uh, I, my first meeting, all the meetings took place west of the Mississippi River, in various locations, never where he resided. And how were, how were you, I'm gonna get back to the story of how, sure. how it happened, but how was it set up? Somebody would call you and say, he'll be at this hotel at this time and show up at this No, um, what happened was somebody did call me, uh, often, the marshals, and uh, they would tell me to go to X city, for instance, the first time. Yeah. And when I got there, there was another message to go to another city. And uh, I arrived there and I was met and I was taken to a hotel. I spent the night there. In the morning I was picked up and I was taken to still another hotel uh, where I met him. And I later found out he was not staying at the hotel where we were meeting. And uh, I assume a lot of this was to make sure I, you know, we live in a very leap prone world. <laughs> make sure you hadn't told anybody you were to go <laughs> or, see Sammy Gravano. That's right, or I didn't even tell my wife uh, the first couple of times. And uh, I guess the idea was that if word got out, I'd be followed uh, in order to see, uh, you know, the bad guys. Now, when you went for the first meeting, had mm -hmm. you met him, had you corresponded with him, had you talked to him on the telephone? I talked to him once on the telephone. What was that like? He called. And he said he liked the book, he liked to cover spy, and uh, uh, why didn't we get together? And I, I wanted that too, because if I went ahead with this book, with the dozens and dozens and dozens of hours of interviews that I finally had with him, uh, there had to be some kind of chemistry between us, or it would all be for naught. And uh, the first three days were, first of all, to see how we got along, and, and uh, I didn't take any notes, I didn't have a tape recorder, and uh, we talked about his life. I wanted to get a feel of him. And uh, all the feelings I had, as far as the book was concerned, were very positive. He was very forthright, very candid, as he remained throughout. He never tried to excuse anything. He never tried to find a rationale for his life in the mob. I actually, there are two two things, critical things that happened during his life that were out of his control, which I think contributed heavily to his ending up in Cosa Nostra. But he never made a point of it. He never said, no, well, you know, if this didn't happen. What are those two things? First thing was, um, he, he grew up in Bensonhurst in Long Island. Where am I? Uh, Brooklyn, I mean, I'm, I am tired tonight. <laughs> bang, bang. Uh, all right. Um, which an awful lot of people in New York don't know much about. It's kind of like a Sicilian village in yeah. Flatland. Right. He grew up there and went to school there, but in the fourth grade, a traumatic thing happened. He was held back in the fourth grade, and his parents went to uh, find out what the matter was, and in effect, he, they were told that he probably was a little, a little retarded. What he had, in fact, was dyslexia, severe dyslexia, which nobody, believe me, in Bensoners had ever heard of. And, uh, so he more or less accepted this fact, and... So in his, his own mind, he was retarded, well, not dyslexic. Well, he, he, he couldn't figure it out. But, for instance, humiliations piled on him uh, at school, um, and other students would be asked to spell independence or whatever, and then they would say, Sammy, spell cat. And the whole classroom would break out in titters, right? And... Uh, he was a tough kid, and uh, while he's only five feet five, he was the same. He stopped growing when he was about fourteen. So after school, he would beat up some of these other fellows. If that you'd were make mocking. fun of him, he'd beat yeah. you up. And he said, "You know, that's when I found out violence paid." Because <laughs> I was a major. And that's when effect. he earned the nickname, the bull. It happened a little later. He was ten. First of all, another thing about him, he came from what would be considered a middle class family in uh, in Bensonhurst. It's his parents owned the house uh, they were in. They had a car, a garage, that kind of thing. And uh, they gave him a bicycle when he was 10 years. It's not to say they were wealthy or by any means, but they gave him a bicycle that was stolen. And a couple of days later, a friend said, Hey, Sammy, those are the two fellows, down, boys down in the corner have your bicycle. They were older boys. And he ran down, and sure enough, there they were. And he waited in, both of them. Now, across the street... One at a time or together? Together. As he said, I was getting beat up pretty good, but I was giving a little bit of my own, but I wasn't giving up that bicycle. I was not... I knew I was not going to get another one. And uh, a number of wise, local wise guys lived... Uh, were hung out at a bar across the street from where all this was going on, and they came over, 
And they said, what's going on here? And he said, the, and Sammy says, these guys stole my bike, blah, 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 and this, that, and the other thing. And they listened to this whole thing. And finally, two of them said to the boys, the older boys, leave him alone. It's his bike. Beat it. And if your fathers have any problems with this, they can come see us. And as they left and Sammy started to leave with his bicycle, one of the wise guys called to the other standing on the corner and said, you see this little Sammy? He's like a little bull. Yeah. And that's how he got the name. Sammy Plus you the got bull. that uh, respect that he had, or I guess right. the and sort of sense of these the, guys. Go ahead. No. These were these the only people who uh, didn't care about his dyslexia, his difficulty in reading and writing. They didn't care about any of that, and they were the only ones. Do you like him? He's a, he's a charming guy. Oh, many, I, I've met other uh, wise guys who are charming, too. Uh, yes. He had to like him. You couldn't spend all this time with him and not like him. Is he different from other wise guys you know of his rank? Yeah. Well, I don't know of any of his rank, because yeah. he, he was number, number two. two in the most powerful crime family in America. He's smart. I was impressed about how smart he is. Smart about what? Intelligence, business. The prosecutor in the case said, you know, in a way, Sammy had a wasted life. He would have been a great success as a businessman in construction. And he probably realizes that now? I think he accepts it. Uh, he makes no excuses about himself. The, only, the closest he comes to uh, acknowledging remorse was uh, one line that I thought was very interesting. He said, the fact that he, I gave loyalty to Cosa Nostra above loyalty to my wife and my children is something I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. So that told me a lot about what uh, operates inside. We've got way into the story, but let me just come back uh, sure. to, to you. So you go and you meet him, you spend time with him, right. you, you like him, you're learning a lot, he's open, he's agreeable, he's talking, he's candid, Very matter doesn't of fact. Lie, to, lie to you as far as you can tell? At that time, yes. Did he ever lie to you? No, no. Did he ever not answer any question you asked? I had trouble getting him to answer some things that were touched very closely to him. But, like uh, what? Well, one of the pr problems, which is a um, thing that annoys him a great deal, um, is uh, his wife's brother was killed. And uh, all the headlines, all the papers, all the Gotti people say Sammy killed him, killed the, bo uh, the, the brother of his wife. Well, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm splitting hairs here, but Sammy did not kill the brother, uh, but he let it happen. Was he there? No. He was not there. And then the story came that his body was chopped up, the boy, the brother. Fed to the dogs or something. Well, that's a, that is a total fun. That's one of the things that amuses me about the media. I have read this story about how the dog pranced into mm -hmm. Sammy's in-law's um, living room with the hand of their son in its mouth. It's total fabrication. It never happened. And any reporter could have gone to the police and said, hey, what, I, what they did was fine. Uh, his body was chopped up, but they found it, I don't know, miles away. They found a hand. No dog ran in, but it made for a grisly story, didn't it? Horrifying story. Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything about Cosa Nostra that you didn't know because of your own writing experience? In the abstract, I didn't learn anything. Well, but in the specific. In the, the scenes, how these men at the top think and act, uh, how, their reactions to things, what they want, what they do to gain things. It's very intimate. That's the main reason I wrote this book, uh, Charlie. I didn't write, it's not a defense of Sammy and what he did. There's no sugarcoating at all in the book. But for me, this was a golden opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity to uh, reveal the mafia in America, the innermost sanctums of the mafia in America at its top, at its highest level. And when you see the highest level of the mafia in America, what do you see? You see power and greed and deception and betrayal. And the notion that the way you do business is whacking people, as they say. Well, um, what, no, the, doing the, the, uh, the, the hits, of which there are many, many, are basically a method of control, of discipline, keep people in line. Very few. Or send them a message. Well, if you're dead, there's no, you're well, not much of a message. No, but I mean, you've, 
If you get the guy next to you, then you get the message. All the um, all of Sammy's quote innocent victims unquote, which I've read about in the paper, and all murder is reprehensible. I'm not. I mean, that's obvious. You, you, but all the people who died as a result of his participation in the murders uh, were mob connected. Many of them were killers themselves. So? Uh, the point is, that, well, you were implying that he went out and they killed people at random. And, no, I wasn't implying that at all. Oh, okay. I didn't say that at all. I, I just, but you seem sensitive to, about that subject. I mean, one of the criticisms is that, that you hear when you do this is, A, you know, this is a guy who killed 19 people. Right. Had a role in the killing of 19 Absolutely. people. Absolutely. You step forward and say, well, gee, they were all in the mafia. You know, they were all people with unclean hands. Well, I suppose I said that, and it does sound bad, and I agree with you, is the fact is that all these people knew what could happen. Murder in that world, which is another thing I want, it's a world so removed from your world or my world yeah. that it's ludicrous almost. But murder in that world that he lived in is an everyday common event. And uh, they don't even call it a murder. It's a piece of work. Piece of work. Yeah. Gotti. What did you learn about John Gotti, who sits in a prison in Marion, I guess? Yes, he is there. I don't think he'll be there forever in Marion. They only can keep him there so long. They'll move him somewhere, I'm sure. Because that's the most secure prison in America? It is. They've got another one in Colorado that's supposed to be more secure. Okay. What did you learn about John Gotti? I want to come to some of these other questions in a minute. It, it, the extraordinary megalomania number one, which we knew about, but Sammy had some very interesting insights about him. For instance, it's well known that John Gotti was a degenerate gambler. Gambled constantly. And Sammy had a funny line about it. You know, he gambled every day, he bet on every sport. If there were 10 football games, he bet on 10 football games, the whole line. He said in all this time, he never heard John Gotti once say, boy, I had a real winner yesterday. <laughs> All he ever talked about were the losers. I lost. The horse lost by half a nose. The Jets didn't cover by half a point. And Sammy, and this is just speculation on his part, but I think it was very incisive. He said, you know, he had read somewhere or heard somewhere that really degenerate gamblers want to lose inside unconsciously. Did he translate that to some, yeah. interpolate that to some notion that Gotti wanted to be caught? Not actively, consciously, but certainly on the record, John Gotti did everything possible to be uh, to contribute to his own downfall. Out, you know, in Cosa Nostra, it's supposed to be a secret society. You're supposed to be in the shadows. John Gotti is out there every day in his $2,500 yeah. Brioni suits. Because he wanted to fuel the notion that he was invincible. Yes, he did. You're absolutely right. I, I do believe that. He came to, uh, he, as Sammy said, the cameras had a love affair with John Gotti, and he began to have a love affair with himself. He was a media darling. I mean, he was, I mean, for, for the newspaper and television reporters, they had these other bosses with little stubby cigars and sweatshirts on. Well, you see him walking around. Every picture you see, any <laughs> mugshot of these guys, they look like. Or, say, Paul Castellano, dressed well, but he looked like a Wall Street businessman. There was a businessman. There was no, uh, nothing, no excitement, nothing you could do. And here comes John Gotti, and he played it fairly well. As I said earlier, he looked and acted just the way America wanted a gangster to look. And... Sammy, finally, the other captains in the family came to Sammy and says, listen, he's, John's the only, you're the only one John will listen to. You've got to tell, we can't have these meetings every night at the Raven Eye Club. That was the social club on Mulberry right. Street. He said, you, you can hardly talk for hearing the FBI cameras clicking all over the place and vans and they're writing down license. They said, John is handing the whole family over to the FBI. They know who every member is, because if you were a member of, cousin, of the Gambino family, you had to show up at least once a week at the Ravenite Club. And Sammy had to go there every night. What was the attraction of John Gotti to Sammy Gravano and the attraction of Sammy Gravano for John Gotti? 
I think uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, Sammy, I uh, thought John, uh, first of all, he recognized what a charismatic figure he was. He thought he was smart. He certainly did in the beginning think he was smart. And he thought he had the qualities of leadership. John Gotti needed Sammy because in his Gotti's plotting to kill Paul Castellano in the famous sh shooting in front of Spark yeah. Steakhouse. John Gotti could not do this on his own. His crew, which is his group within the family, were, was a work crew. That's what they called crews that went out and, and did the hits. Uh, but still, Paul Castellano was a powerful man. He was the boss of the family. And Sammy had another crew. It was a work crew. And there was still another one named Frank DiCicco, who was, died. That's another story. But John Gotti, uh, you know, he was afraid of Paul Castellano, and he needed Sammy and Frank DiCicco to go along with this plot to kill Castellano. If, if you strike a king, you better kill him. You better kill him and watch out that somebody else isn't going to come after you because of that. Yeah. And somebody so, did, but uh, John escaped. Somebody tried to hit John yes, after it was he hit Vincent Castellano. The Chin Gigante, yeah. uh, who was very close to Paul Castellano and certainly did not like this. They liked Castellano, didn't they? Well, so, uh, the mob people. Well, some, no, what happened with Castellano was he lived in this great mansion on Tote Hill. He was the king of the hill. Staten Island. Yeah, the highest part of Staten Island, great view of the Veranzano Bridge and so on. The most exclusive part of Staten Island. I mean, they, his home uh, cost three and a half million dollars, uh, and it would have cost a lot more if they didn't control a lot of the construction unions. And the rest, he never bothered to come down, down into the valley, so to speak, to the clubs the social clubs. Mm -hmm. He lost touch with the street and uh, people, the members began to grumble that he was just interested in lining his own pocket. But is that why Gotti made the hit against Castellano? Because no. Gotti simply wanted to be uno he, numero. He capitalized on that. He took advantage of that, that Feeling, flaw that yes, Castellano because had. Castellano despised Gotti, who was protected by his then underboss, a man named Della Croce, I'm, I know this is getting complicated, no. but when Della Croce died, John Gotti knew it was either him or Paul Castellano. One or the other would have to go, because Castellano despised him. It's quite complicated because... I understand. Let me, let me go to some other points here. Yeah. So during all of this, what did Sammy ask of you? Tell my story right? Get it right? Yes. Now, I'm sure he didn't come out and say it in so many words, but in effect, he expected that. What did he want from you? Good book, and that's it? He, yes, he wanted, I think, he wanted... Or what he's got, all this attention and telling his story and being on two hours of primetime television. I think one of the things he wanted this book to do, probably the most important thing, was that when he uh, flipped, as they say, when he turned government witness, he was so vilified by Gotti and his allies, for instance, the dog story. Yeah. And he was called the rat, the rat, the rat, the yeah, rat, the rat. Well, look, he doesn't deny he's a rat. Right. He's very front, out front about it, but he says, who did I rat against? Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> rat against uh, but he wanted the reality of why he did. I think that was the most important thing. He wanted the reality of what he did and why he did it conveyed. Well, so he's got your book, and that's yeah. all he asks of you, nothing else. Not that I know of. Everybody believes, most people believe, he's getting something out of this. I know, it's a big you know, thing. Even the district attorney of the state of state New York has waded states. into this. That's the problem, and I tell you, I'm, I'm really sorry about this. I would love to go into great detail with you about this, but apparently the uh, state attorney general has served, taken legal action against me and the publisher. Uh, I think they We're trying to force you to release all documents you have. No, they want to see the contract, my contract with the publisher, and um, so what? My what, now let me. My lawyers and the publisher's lawyers have said we're all going to answer all this, and we're going to answer it in court, and we don't want you running around on radio and television, um, probably saying something inflammatory, which they're probably right that I would do. So they, I can't say anything. All I can say is this. The one thing they'll let me say 
is that I have not violated the Son of Sam law, and we've already talked to the Attorney General about it, and apparently that's not good enough. Okay, but can you say anything definitive about the fact that Sam Gravano is getting nothing out of this publication of a book written by Peter Moss? Well, you know, you've got me in a tough spot here. They say, I cannot comment on anything, and, and I want to comment on it. And uh, my comment, if I made one, would be positive. Okay. Is any reason you wouldn't want anybody to see that contract? Uh, personally? Yeah. And but the, again, the, I'm getting into something I shouldn't. First Amendment. That's the only reason. But a, yes. It, well, it's not, you that see, the contents of it. it's not the contents of it. It's the, specific, the fact that... If they can get my contract, they can you decide to write a book and get yours. And I'd, be, embar I'd be embarrassed by what I got. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so Gravano makes a deal. He decides to flip mm -hmm. because he thinks he thinks that Gotti is going to. Gotti insists on being at, a, at all the meetings with his lawyer. His lawyer being there, he gets all these signals that say to him, Gotti is going to blame me for this. I'm going to be the heavy for this, right. and Gotti is going to come somehow work this deal so that I come out the loser. Right. That's what's in his head. That's correct. So in the end, perhaps standing alone, he flips. He yeah. calls the prosecutor or the FBI and says, let's talk. Yep. And then later he calls Peter Moss through some lady and says, let's talk. Yes. And he tells your story. Yes. Can I say one thing? Yes. I, you know, when I heard this theory, <clears throat> of his uh, perception that, uh, that Gotti was going to make him take the fall, as they say. I speak like they do. I've been around long enough. <laughs> I talked to the prosecutor in the case, John Gleason, who's now a federal judge and an ex extraordinary man. And he told me that, several, that it was not fantasy on Sammy's part. For several months before Sammy uh, showed up to cooperate, Gleason and his prosecutorial team were tailoring their prosecution on exactly the same theory that Sammy had, that he, Sammy, would take the fall. Hmm. And you that know, was kind of corroboration, no? Yeah, I, mean, I read your book, but you know what else is true? I watched Diane Sawyer on Turning Point, too. He's acting like God. He's cocky. Uh, he's basically saying things like, well, if they come after me, it's going to be a shootout. You know, they'll get me or I'll No, get he didn't them. say that. If they come after me and they've got a gun, I'm going out in a box. I think that was his phrase. Because he doesn't have access to a gun? I don't think so. Why not? Well, I, be, I don't think he does. And I think because, you know, he was convicted. He was sentenced. He said, you know. Who's watching him? I don't know. You know, I really don't know. I don't even know where he is. I can't reach him if, if, if I'm going to call. It's one of these, I'll call you. Don't yeah, call and me. he does, maybe once a week. When's the last time you heard from him? About six days ago. What did he say? He, he wanted to know what the jacket was like, the book jacket. Does he like it? I guess he does. I, this is what I told him. Mm -hmm. I said, Sammy, uh, you're on the front, and I'm on the back, and it's easy to see who had the facelift. <laughs> and he left. What plastic surgery? Was it because he had to straighten his nose out or something? Inside. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was part... Not just vanity, it was part to help him breathe. Yeah, he couldn't didn't. breathe. He really okay. couldn't breathe. The mafia. Changing? It's in total disarray at the moment. The federal government and whoever prosecuted Gravano. Mm, oh, Gotti. Not Gotti, right. And Gravano for a time. He served how many, how much time? Uh, five years. Federal government believes whatever when they weigh the testimony of Sammy Gravano versus convict, convicting all the people that he helped convict versus one guy getting off, essentially, mm -hmm. who acknowledges 19 murders, mm -hmm. they made a good deal. Right? Mm -hmm. Did they? The government usually does that. Okay, but do you agree with them? Yes, I can't change that system. And, no, and not it, change the system. Was it a good deal for everybody concerned? Oh, yeah, I think the mafia is on the ropes today. I don't think it's going to go away, but it'll never be what it was. I think he essentially destroyed its structure. Not only Gotti, but two other family bosses. Vincent Tachin Giganti has gone on trial in June because Sammy testified that he was, in fact, sane. That was a marvelous bit of... Uh, 
You know, when you're in a guy who walks around Greenwich Village in his bathing suit, pajamas. I mean, in his pajamas and his robe. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> Underboss is the book, Sammy the Bull Gravano's Study of Life in the Mafia by Peter Moss. Peter Moss has written well uh, about Serpico, has written well about the Balaji Papers, um, and it is a, a, a remarkably interesting story because it gives you uh, at least some insight into a life that all of us don't want to be part of and don't know anything about, and somehow... Uh, is compelling and fascinating witness how many people are buying this book and how many people are watching television interviews with Gravano as well as with Peter Moss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. It's always a great pleasure to be with you. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. See you next On time. Monday, John Gotti, one of America's most infamous figures of organized crime, died at the age of 61. In the 1980s, the New York mobster that the New York tabloids called the Dapper Don was the face of modern organized crime to much of the country. His death has stirred discussion of the state of organized crime today in this country. Joining me now for a consideration of this question, Selwyn Rabb, former Metropolitan reporter for the New York Times, who is working on a book on the mob right now, and Abraham Abramovsky, professor of criminal law at the Fordham University School of Law. I'm pleased to welcome them both to the table. John Gotti, why was he such a legend? He was a legend because the media made him a legend. It was all fiction. He was a creation of the media and the tabloids, and uh, he was turned into a glamorized folk hero. He had a lot of, a lot of credit for things he didn't do. Uh, without television, without the newspapers, he would have been a minor character. Well, now that's an interesting question, because one of the things I've always wondered is, who invented John Gotti? In other words, was it the FBI and law enforcement who said, focus on this guy, he's the new boss, knowing that they already had an indictment? Mm -hmm. Was it the press who took one look at him and said, look at him, he's irresistible, he looks like the gangsters for, from the movies, mm -hmm. or was it, was it the media? Well, it was a combination, of course, but the media uh, elevated... was it John Scott? Gotti who said, I love this, and essentially put himself out there in the public eye when he could have hidden? Yeah, well, the distinction was he didn't hide like all the uh, traditional mob leaders. What he did was he loved the attention. He basked in it. Uh, that, that famous line that he was sitting in a restaurant with um, Sammy the Bull Gravano, and Sammy saw, uh, Sammy, uh, saw people staring at, at the Gotti, and he said, John, do you uh, object to this? Do you want me to tell them to stop staring? And he said, no, no, that's my public. That's my public, which is pretty much, Professor, the antithesis of a mob boss's position, working as the leader of a secret society where by the nature of the deal, to join up, to become a made guy, the very mention or admission that the society even exists is supposed to be punishable by death. Well, you certainly don't want to stick out as a person that is looked at. What you try to do is you, you try to work the shadows in the back rooms, maintain your anonymity as much as possible, and then ply your trade. So did John Gotti help the Mafia by putting it on the map, perhaps Forgive me for this, but I'm making a suggestion that, that if you look back from The Sopranos today to when he started this, popularize the Mafia, or did he hurt it very badly? I think that he hurt it rather badly. I think that, well, may, he popularized it and he hurt it very badly. I think he hurt his own family very badly by insisting that they come to the same place to give them the respect that the Rav Knight Club and so forth. And, you know, it doesn't take a genius on the side of law enforcement to figure out that if they are summoned to a particular place at a particular time, the, the video machines are going to be going. Now, why did he do that? Every Wednesday, every captain in the Gambino crime family, the men who lorded over the crews of soldiers, had to report to the Ravenite Social Club, mm -hmm. where they had to know the FBI, the NYPD Intelligence Division were watching, filming. What was the reason for operating in the open? He uh, gave the, he was a gift to the FBI and to the prosecutors. He gave them a who's who of who was in the family. The reason, of course, is that uh, obvious insecurity on his part that he needed so much attention and adulation and loyalty and he didn't care. He felt that somehow or other he could either fix a jury the way he had done in previous cases before he was convicted, that he was, uh, uh, he was so insulated he would never be captured. And uh, that was part of that uh, pathological personality that he had, that if anyone showed him the slightest disrespect, there was one 
a minor capo from Connecticut who couldn't come there uh, on the appointed day. He had him killed. And that was his idea of how he would intimidate and uh, frighten and he would run the family with that kind of tyrannical uh, overseeing attitude. And that was, but that was part of this whole personality makeup. He loved it. He, uh, he thought of himself as some kind of Robin Hood. Yet there was something there, meaning when I spoke to wise guys, um, as I'm sure you did, about John Gotti, in the early days, they felt that he was finally the boss they'd been waiting for. A guy from the streets, uh, a guy who didn't mind getting his hands dirty, a guy that hadn't been insulated so far away that you could never get a meeting with him. Well, that was... Uh, you that, disagree, though. There was a dichotomy in the Gambino family, and he certainly was not liked by the, uh, uh, the bosses in the other family. They thought he drew too much attention to the whole concept of organized crime, which was, which was supposed to be a secret organization. And uh, within the family, the Gambino family, one of the five major families in the New York area, uh, he sort of promised he was going to bring a reform administration, a share the wealth concept that the, uh, he, had, he had engineered the murder of uh, his predecessor, Paul Castellano, and there was, some, uh, there was some discontent in the family that Castellano wasn't uh, sharing the wealth, and Gotti said he would do so. But they quickly learned that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't that kind of uh, reform and uh, uh, eager to help out anyone else in the family. And he certainly antagonized... He viewed himself that way, though. He viewed himself. On one tape, he said, listen, I'm not a greedy boss. All I want is a good sandwich, and, you know, I'm not like Paul. I don't care about the money. But at the same time, anyone who crossed him or he thought wasn't paying off or wasn't channeling or funneling enough money to him, he had him killed. So, and that word spread very quickly. But a best example of how he was disliked was that two other families, the Genovese family run by uh, Vincent the Chin Gigante and the Lucchese family, uh, tried to kill him almost uh, three months after he took office. So he was not uh, liked and uh, probably the best example, the best example of why he was overthrown and why he was undermined was because of all the rats, all the squealers in the family who detested him, who felt he had the he had abused them, uh, he had in many ways threatened them, and there was no shortage. The FBI had about five or six people inside his own family that were ratting on him. Including, ultimately, in the end, Ravano. his own right-hand man, his own underboss, the man who should have been closest to him, most loyal, his, his one-time consigliere and underboss. Yeah, well, doesn't that tell you something about his uh, choices of people around him? And, uh, his, and his selection and his whole... Uh, ability to uh, uh, to run a family or an organization. It, it may be. It may have been a singular worst personnel decision. So, was Gotti an effective boss? And if not, who was the best boss? I think he was a little bit more effective than than my friend to the left says. Uh, he he did have, I believe, the respect of a certain faction of of organized crime. I would say that. Certainly, bosses like Giganti probably will be deemed in history to be more effective, ultimately. Which is very funny, considering that Gotti played the role of the gangster, at least visually, the clothes, the cars, the right. phalanx of bodyguards that we knew from fiction, whereas Giganti, um, dressed in a bathrobe, wandered the streets muttering to himself, pretended to be non compus mentis, or was, there's still a debate, uh, while running the family that was considered the Ivy League of the underworld, right. yet you think he was more effective? I would think so. He lasted long. He certainly did, and he brought, I believe, in the long run, less attention to his family. And uh, I think that the role model of the future in the mob organizations is not going to be Gotti. It, it's not going to be that type of attitude. It's not going to be that in-your-face I'm not worried about you prosecutors and you feds type deal. I think it's going to be back to the old Carmine Galanti days, you know, quiet, out of the spotlight, doing their thing. But remember what happened to him. He was, um, his body was carried out under the sign that said, Joe and Mary's Restaurant, That's outgo right. Outgoing Orders Are Specialty. That's right. So there are people who have pronounced at various times that this indictment 
this case is a death knell to the mob, uh, that the mob is down on one knee, that the mob is dead. Uh, is the mob dead? The mob is not dead. The mob has been alive and will be alive. The question is... Is the mob is, making the big money it was making 10, 15 years ago? I don't think so. And the reason that the mob is not making the big money, as big a money, is that there are new kids on the block. There's uh, all kinds of organized crime groups, ranging from the Russians to the Colombians to the Mexicans to the Nigerians. It's almost you come up with a nationality and there's an alleged organized crime group around. So, and I want you to weigh in on that. Where, well, as, as John Gotti so often said, where are we going here? Where's the mob going? It's wounded and it's far from dead and uh, these declarations about it being finished have often been uh, mistaken. They have the remarkable power of uh, rejuvenation. Uh, what most people don't understand is that the mob is always fed, or organized crime with the mafia, has fed essentially on uh, its bread and butter, which is gambling and loan sharking. And that's always been the seed money uh, for other ventures, for other enterprises. And the distinction now is there's no question because of a combination of factors, a very tough RICO law, racketeer influence, corrupt organizations law, which has given the government a, a prosecutorial tool that it never had before. And the incredible technology, electronic technology available to eavesdrop now that wasn't around even 10 years ago. But the distinction is that uh, unlike the other organized crime factions, the question is why has the mafia lasted for 70 years? And the reason is that the organization is more important than the individual. That you can always, that, that even if a boss goes, uh, the organization remains. And a dis major distinction is that the FBI and prosecutors and the Justice Department have been very effective in other cities. We have only had one crime family. In New York, we have five, plus at least two others in the New Jersey area. So whenever there's a vacuum, there's someone to fill that vacuum. And I think the other real uh, nemesis or perhaps problem that's going to be confronted by the Justice Department and all the uh, law enforcement agencies is that organized crime is no longer a priority. It's no longer a criminal priority. And uh, especially with the impact of terrorism. And there has to be a reduction. I, don't, I know already there has been a reduction in the uh, vigilance, in the surveillance, and the whole technique of keeping an eye on what's going on. I've so spoken to organized crime figures um, within the last three or four months who said, Johnny, we've had more sit-downs in the last eight months than we've had in the last eight years, meaning that they feel that the FBI is off their backs, that mm -hmm. the constant surveillance has abated, yeah. that their ability to move around and even get together without one or more of them or all of them being followed um, is over for now and that they're taking advantage of that. Is the end of the government's juggernaut signaled by the prioritizing of terrorism going to lead to the rebirth of the mafia, uh, let's say, of the 70s? I think it's possible. Uh, I don't know about the, the rebirth of the 70s, but certainly you have X number of manpower and you have limited resources. Now, when you're in a situation that you're worried about the health, safety, and well-being of all of your citizenry, all kind of a sudden, the Al-Qaeda uh, organization and others like it become your prime targets as, as opposed to the Gambino family. Now, everybody um, has been taken with the, uh, the romance, the familiarity with the, uh, the specter of shows like The Sopranos, although you don't really see a John Gotti character on The Sopranos. Um, why do you think it is that the mob, even wounded, even down on one knee, still captures the public mm -hmm. imagination so much? And how much do you think John Gotti had to do with that? Gotti had a little to do with it. Uh, the Sopranos has a little to do with it, and the, myth, and the uh, myths that were created by uh, movies like The Godfather have a lot to do with it. It validates their existence in the sense that these kinds of... Uh, uh, fictional programs or fictional movies create the image that there are good mafiosi and bad mafiosi. Some of them just are, some of them are doing this because they have no other choice. It's the only way they can get ahead in the world. And that's where the real danger is. Plus, people like Gotti um, created this idea that here was someone opposing the government, anti-establishment, the vicarious kick 
of someone who now, can, Americans always are drawn to the character like right. that. And then they, and especially young kids who... From Daniel Boone, uh, any well, loner who, who, who went who defies, out... Who defies. Yes. So he, he filled that picture uh, at someone you could get away, you could live well, <laughs> you could be an important, powerful person, and you could be a media, uh, a, a media character, celebrity. And he fulfilled that kind of view. It's a quick way of getting ahead and becoming an important personality. And that's where I think the media really falls down, by glorifying people like this, or saying there's, there's some kind of justification to what they do and the reason they have to do it. Yet he did sell papers. When Gotti was on the front page of the Daily News or the New York Post, the papers went. Yeah, well, here's an example of how we misstate the press and the media in general um, confuse our priorities. On the same day that John Gotti died, Ben Ward died. Ben Ward was the first black police commissioner in New York. He was relegated to the back pages, and even my obituary, and I like getting on front on page one, was on page one, and it was much longer than, uh, than, Gotti, than, than Ben Ward's obituary. And on the what same that? day that John Gotti died, the FBI and the Defense Department and the CIA uh, arrested the man who was charged with allegedly plotting to carry out the first dirty bomb attack in New York. Well, but th there's perhaps which a, came as uh, as a, I mean there was there was a fight for the headline that day, right. which is interesting. Well, on the question of Ward and uh, Gotti, you could almost say, look how editors and uh, look at those two deaths, crime pays. John Gotti, sum him up in twenty seconds. I think he was uh, viewed as a charismatic leader for his group. I think he was viewed as the mafioso. But in fact, I think he hurt organized crime and his family more than he helped it. His legacy in 20 seconds? He did more to undermine his own family and organized crime than any single figure in the last 50 years. Well, he certainly did leave his mark, no matter how you view him or his time. Uh, probably since Al Capone, the most notorious mob boss, of our times. We'll be right back.